part of a strong force of ARC members from Patna and manning one of the top centers therein and is a very proficient anterior segment surgeon. He has already been conducting immensely successful PG programs on behalf of his hospital and is definitely a man to reckon. So we shall go on to the first talk on disc evaluation of the glaucomatous disc and its mimickers to be presented by me. Am I seen? Yeah, the slides are on. And Chitra needs no introduction. She is there all the time. <laughs> so, uh, uh, without any delay, I'll go on to my talk. As we all know that the optic disc evaluation is a very critical discriminant in diagnosing glaucoma. But having said that, we need to remain cognizant of the fact that there are biological variabilities and different Indian studies have shown that it could range anything from 2.25 to 3.36 millimeter square. It could be a large disc. We could not, we cannot get complacent that it is, they are all high myopes, we need to be suspicious. It could be a smaller disc and it gets smaller as the hyperopia increases. It could also be an elongated oblique or a tilted disc, which is more commonly seen in astigmats, but could be seen in myopes too. So it becomes critical for us to look at the five R's, the scleral ring, the rim, the retinal nerve fiber layer, the region of the peripapillary atrophy and the retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. Then we talk of the disc size. We are talking about evaluating on the slit lamp microscope with a ruby lens. And depending whether you're using a 60D or a 70D or a 90D, the magnification factors are different. So you essentially, by viewing through the slit view, through the ruby lens, you get a more stereoscopic view, better illumination and magnification. And if you narrow the slit beam and you bring it down to overlay the disc margin, you could actually measure the disc height. So a cup disc ratio of more than 0.6 would need to be looked on with suspect. And also if there's an asymmetry of the disc between the two eyes. Beyond that, we also need to look at the dream disc area, which tells us its own story. We need to look at the vessels running over the disc and beyond. We need to look at the ascent rule, and we need to concentrate on the margin of the optic disc. As I had earlier alluded to, with a slit beam, we can measure the vertical diameter, and we could classify them as a small, medium, or a large disc. Arbitrarily, you could say that a disc diameter of less than one could have a mean cup disc ratio of 0.26, a disc diameter of more than two could have a cup disc ratio of 0.55. The other area which we need to look carefully is the relation of the disc with the cup. You know, largely, a small disc would have a small cup and a large disc would have a large cup. But what becomes more important to see is a small disc with a 0.3 cup disc ratio could be a suspicious glaucomatous disc because we need to look at the other telltale signs and not necessarily only a large cup in a large disc is viewed, viewed on as a glaucomatous disc. The next thing which we need to look at is a rim counter, which is, could be orange to pink. And if there is a pallor a focally, we need to look at with attention. We need to look at the rim configuration, whether it's getting thinned out, whether there's a notch, how the vessel is traveling over it. And all of these are so important. In fact, an NRR evaluation is a lot more sensitive than the vertical CDR, which I was earlier describing. But what we need to remember again, as I told you earlier, a vertical cup disc ratio of 0.7 needs to be looked on with all suspicion because only in 5% of the population, it could be a 0.7 cup disc ratio and yet be normal. Again, an asymmetry more than 0.2 needs to be looked on with suspicion because in 1% of the population, it could be normal. So we need to be very cautious of that. Next is the RNFL evaluation and it's best evaluated with the red free filter. These are axons which run from the upper to the, on the lower pole towards the peripapillary region and they have their own luster. And these axon bundles give that impression of striations and when there is a degeneration of the RNFL fiber, the perivapillary vessels come to be seen more prominently. In fact, the area of the RNFL defect could be double the size of the venule. 
these could be slit defects wedge shaped defects or a diffuse loss so if you look at this this is an early glaucoma it has a typical inferior rnfl defect in the red free light as you can see and if you look at the oct it again tells you that yes there is an inferior rnfl defect and that corroborates the story this is again a case of a unilateral glaucoma with that rnfl defect seen inferiorly and that superior field defect which is there which again tells us that we are bang on looking at glaucoma again the isent rule is important which means that the inferior rim is thicker followed by the superior than the temporal and nasal now if this relationship is altered that the inferior becomes thinner than the superior our antennas have to be up and we need to look at all of this and also see whether there is any notches or thinning or loss of rim or erosion the other thing which we need to look at is the area of peripapillary atrophy this has an alpha zone which is just subjacent to the disc which is hypo or hyperpigmented and it is characteristically seen in myopia with that uh, uh, temporal crescent and just beyond it is the beta zone this area because of the overlying loss of rp and corio capillaris the underlying sclera and the choroid are seen and this is actually a red flag and if there is an increase in the size of pa ppa then beta zone we need to actually get clued on that is the glaucomatous disease progressing and this is even more so significant in the normal tension glaucoma now if you look at this uh, right disc it is obviously vertically oval and it has that ppa and the field defect all of it adds to it you let you know that we are looking at an advanced glaucoma here then you need to look at the vessels now bio bionetting of vessels is something quite specific of glaucoma and if if there is a significant neural tissue loss you can see the way it arches up and climbs on the rims and moves on and a typical bionet sign but then we need to remember that it could also be seen in a large physiological cup again a diffuse and focal arteriolar nod narrowing is typically seen in glaucoma but mind you it can be seen in non arteritic aon too again bearing of blood vessels is characteristic of glaucoma because the underlying neural tissue is lost and it stands out in that white background but then 14% are seen in normal in a study done by sutton et al so the disc damage likelihood scale becomes very significant because it's highly reproducible and correlates with the field loss now it can't been classified into small disc of less than 1.5 uh, average disc 1.5 to 2 and more is large so even beyond 4 you look at the disc and the rim ratio rim area ratio and as it becomes lesser and lesser you get conscious that you're looking at glaucoma and it further elaborates and tells you in which clock card is the thinning more or the notch or the rim loss and you are able to correlate these disc findings in your consecutive cases splinter hemorrhage can overlie a disc or lie in the peripapillary region it is quite evanescent could disappear immediately or last for a few months and these are characteristically seen in uh, an adiabatic patient or those in anti glaucoma or who has had a pvd but more importantly when these disappear they would leave a notch there would be a erosion of a disc margin an area of in fact and it would and these are actually prognosticators that you need to have a tighter control of the glaucoma disease process acquired pit of the optic nerve is another pathognomic feature of a glaucomatous disc it could be seen more on the upper and the lower pole and in that affected area the lamina cribrosa extends into that area of pit or the notch and it could come with its characteristic field defect so then you need to look at the rim the nerve fiber layer defect the splinter hemorrhages the notching the acquired pit the sausterization becomes more prominent as the neural tissue is lost to actually in advanced glaucoma have a characteristic bean pot appearance in the early stages it could have a concentric enlargement or it could present as a splenic sclerotic thing but then the challenge comes when you look at the mimickers and these are the different discs which have to be looked on with suspicion maybe you could even assume that they are glaucoma suspect unless you are able to rule out this is a tilted disc now it is characteristically seen in myopes or astigmats and if you see that because of the inferior rim uh, disc uh, hypoplasia which occurs in these discs then it gives you a field defect but what diagnoses it or differentiates it from glaucoma is that these fields would not progress they would be static then you know that you are not dealing with a glaucomatous disease this is an optic pit 
Now, it could be, should not be confused with an acquired pit of the optic nerve, which tends to be more on the poles. And this would again have a characteristic superior field effect and actually have a macular uh, fluid collection. So these have to co be correlated and kept in view before you jump it to be a glaucoma. Again, an optic disc coloboma would have an inferior neuroretinal rim thin or absent, and this has to be viewed as not as a glaucomatous disc. A dysplastic disc actually cannot be picked up in OCT. Again, this is something where you, you are suspicious that it could be glaucomatous, but if you do the fields and the fields do not progress, the intraocular pressures remain normal, then you are able to label them as a dysplastic disc. A small disc, we need to be very wary of these discs because even a small cup could be having the glaucomatous disease. We need to look at the rim and the notch. We need to do the fields. And if all else is normal, then you could sit back and say that this is not glaucoma. The area of concern is a neurological problem. It, typical differences are that in a glaucomatous optic neuropathy, the palate does not extend beyond the cup. Whereas in a non-glaucomatous optic atrophy, the palate extends beyond the cup. Again, it's a focal rim loss in a glaucomatous disease, and there is no focal rim loss in a non-glaucomatous disease. But then there are exceptions. Now, pallor could be absent in a non-glaucomatous optic atrophy in an early intracranial compressive lesion. Again, in glaucoma, the pallor can be more than cupping, wherein, wherein you have had an acute rise of intraocular pressure. Now, this was a young patient who was treated as for NTG. Somehow the intraocular pressure was, did not seem to correlate with the drugs which were given and he started getting a vision drop. Now, in the early stages of glaucoma, you would not have a vision drop. A vision drop is characteristic of an advanced stage of glaucoma. So this indicates an MRI to be done. And when the MRI was done, it showed that the patient had a sphenoethmoidal meningioma. And the need of an MRI is so distinctively important in these cases. Now, this is a case where it looks glaucomatic as a vertical oval cup, not very obvious rim narrowing. But when a fields was done, it showed a bitemporal hemianopia and the field and the MRI showed a pituitary macroadenoma with cellar extension. Now, this is again a disc with the rim. This patient was again being treated for glaucoma. But then it did appear that there was some IOP unrelated factors which was there. A dig into the history told that he had a history of perinatal hypoxia. And when an MRI was done, there was hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. There was periventricular leukomalacia which told us that we were looking at an optic disc excavation. Now, this is a disc where there is a disc a pallor, pallor and atrophy in one and the disc edema in the other. These are commonly seen in frontal lobe lesions, more in olfactory lobe meningiomas, called the Foster Kennedy syndrome. But here, a small disc is actually called a disc at risk because, because of the crowding of the nerve fibers, the vascular component of the disease can be significant. This was actually an um, AON and the typical attitudinal field defect helped us to go further. Again, this was a large disc, little more pallor, and the field showed a superior quadrantinopia, wherein when you did an MRI, it showed infarcts in the occipital lobe. This was again a significantly a large disc, could have was being treated for a, a glaucoma process, but somewhere along the line, a suspicion arose. There was a superior quadrantic field defect and he had uh, actually a midline shift, a space occupying lesion, and we actually, this patient was lost. So in a nutshell, we need to look at the disc size, be suspicious if you see an unusual shape, determine the vertical cup disc ratio, look at the rim, look at the rim shape, look at the RNA, look at the disc hemorrhages, look for the vascular changes, please look at the beta zone, please keep in mind that the high myo, we need to rule out glaucoma, Keep in view that there could be sinister non glaucomatous causes lying underneath, and please correlate visual fields with optic disc changes at all times. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Not able to stop sharing. Okay, thank you, Sidra. That was really wonderfully done. I think uh, Gauri will be our next presenter, and everybody knows Gauri. Uh, from Bangalore, Pranitrale, and uh, she'll be talking about visual fields, and uh, I think though the time is less, yeah, let yeah. us hear some calls yeah, from yeah. Gauri. Yeah, I will uh, share my screen, just a just second. One, uh, Gauri? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Introduce you, just a minute. Our next speaker is Dr. Gauri, who would be detailing us on how to read a visual field printout. 
Dr. Gauri is a consultant to Akma Services from Prabhai Clinic and Research Center and has had a special attribute of actually winning best paper awards in four different years of the GSI conference. That's admirable. She has published articles in peer reviewed journals, has been a reviewer of leading international journals and has research interest in a variety of issues in ophthalmology. We are indeed indebted to you, Dr. Gauri, for being with us and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Dr. Chitra, for the kind introduction. So without much delay, I'll go on to my topic. So how do we read a visual field uh, printout? So what we have to re realize is uh, what is being measured is the visual field. And we all know that it is all the space that I can see at any given uh, instant. And what we essentially do is static perimetry. And it measures something known as threshold. The unit of measurement of this is decibel. And it represents the relative sensitivity of points on the island of vision. So more the decibel, lesser the light in intensity which is projected and higher the sensitivity of the retina. So when we choose a test, it is a combination of the strategy, which is either full threshold, CETA, CETA fast, etc. The program which is used, the area which is being tested, that is either 30-2, 24-2, 10-2 macular, etc. And the technique, which is either white on white or blue on yellow, etc. So it is a combination of all these three. So let's go ahead and look at how we read a printout. It helps to have these uh, region-based approaches. So the first zone is where you have the patient data where the name of the patient, date of birth, the pupil diameter, visual acuity, and the refractive error should be entered. Encourage your perimetries to enter everything. Even the visual acuity should not be left unentered. The test data tells you what is the test which is being uh, done and what is the strategy which is used, the stimulus size which is used, and the other factors such as the fixation monitor being used. So the age is important because the interpretation of the raw data by the stat pack is, by, uh, is age dependent. Also, the size of the pupil automatically is measured by some Humphrey perimeters. Otherwise, you have to enter it. A constricted or a dilated pupil can give rise to certain you know, uh, uh, visual field defects, which could be confused. So refractive error should be corrected for near vision, else it can lead on to generalized depression. So let's quickly look at this visual field and see what's wrong with it. If you can see here, the fixation losses are 18 by 18. So what is wrong with this patient? The blind spot is on the right side. This patient, they have actually entered the eye wrong as the left eye. So this patient, the perimetrist has made an error the patient has done the test wonderfully. The blind spot is on the right side. But since the perimetrist attended, uh, uh, you, you entered it as the left eye, it was always searching for the blind spot here. And therefore, you see the fixation losses are 18 by 18. So the next uh, point that we have to look at is the reliability indices. This is this box over here, where you have the fixation losses, the false positives, and the false negative. So, more than 20% of fixation losses is generally unreliable. How do we test this? By presenting the stimulus on the blind spot. False positives are when the patient pushes the response button, even when the stimulus is not projected for just the sound or in a periodicity, the patient keeps on pressing the response button. So again, greater than 33% is marked as unreliable. If the patient has lost his or her attention or has fallen off to sleep, then he does not respond even to the brightest stimulus. So this is what is captured as a false negative. And more than 33% again is unreliable. So let's look at this uh, field. So there, here the fixation losses are marked as 7 by 17. But, and the field has been marked as low patient reliability. But if you look at the gaze tracking, see here, this is the, the infrared tracking which tracks the eye throughout the test. And you can see that the upward deflections which indicate eye movement are practically very, very small. So the patient has actually maintained his or her fixation, but then you are seeing that there is a fixation loss over here. So the disc is also quite okay and doesn't correlate. I mean, though there is an inferior, this thing here, this uh, defect does not correlate with anything that we see on the disc. Why does this happen? As the test is going on, the patient has started to tilt her head. 
so the blind spot moves and so what was initially marked as the blind spot has now moved when the test is going on and therefore this is a pseudo fixation loss so this is something that you need to understand the patient's head should be central and straight and uh, this is this has to be looked at a truly unreliable field will have high fixation losses and uh, the gaze uh, the uh, tracking also will show a lot of deflections and such a field is also marked here as low patient reliability one should have extreme caution and should not preferably interpret such fields so this is another uh, printout where you can see that the first four points usually the field starts testing at these four points first 1 2 3 and 4 so the four points the patient has responded to a certain extent and afterwards he or she has not responded at all so you have all zeros and you can see the false negative is almost 62% so this is a white clover leaf which indicates that the patient is fatigued or not able to understand how to do the test properly this is the reverse of that the same reason the four points are tested initially the perimetrist has not explained how the test is going on so initially the patient has not responded very well he or she has learned on the test and subsequently he has responded quite well so you have these four points as black and the rest are more or less okay so this is the reverse it is initial inattention or a black clover leaf so the next uh, region that we look at is the gray scale so this we just need to view with defocus and look for general trend so here i would say there is some defect in the superior nasal field which respects the horizontal meridian that is the only information that i will look for the fifth zone is the total deviation numerical plot so if you look at the normal sensitivity and the patient's retinal sensitivity and you look at the difference at each point that is what gives you the total deviation numerical plot so this tells you how defective the patient's field is when compared to the normal of the same age group so the uh, this total deviation numerical probability plot has no meaning unless we convert it into probabilities so that is what the total deviation probability plot does so these are the p values which are there with these symbols and each of these numbers is converted into the probability points so wherever you have this dark black square that means that it is very highly likely that the patient's threshold is abnormal that is p less than 0.5% and the other uh, symbols indicate these probabilities as shown here lower the p value the greater its clinical significance the next zone is the pattern deviation numerical plot and this uh, what happens is uh, in the total deviation numerical plot the seventh best retinal sensitivity is converted to zero and then this is added to all the points in the tdnp and this is what gives you the pattern deviation probability plot numerical plot sorry so this pattern deviation numerical plot forms the basis for the ghd test as well so again this numerical plot we can't make too much sense out of the numbers we have to rely on the pattern deviation probability plot again where we have these symbols which will tell us how likely that this area of the visual field is abnormal so after these two plots we'll have to look at the raw data we'll have to look at the suspicious areas which were indicated by the total deviation map and you have to follow a standard geographic sequence so the fixation the fovea should have thresholds more than 36 or 37 around the fovea you have it in your 30s and as you go into the periphery you have the threshold in the 20s so after these areas we come to the statistical indices so these are all the various statistical indices which are there the short term fluctuation and cpst used to be showed for the full threshold testing and they are not shown for the ceta standard or the ceta fast testing so each one of these will look at mean deviation it represents the height of the hill of vision it is the average of the overall severity of the visual field loss so a negative value will indicate that the patient's overall sensitivity is worse than the normal individual by that many decibels a positive value indicates that the patient's overall sensitivity is better than the normal individual here again there is a p value which will tell you the significance of the particular mean deviation value so the pattern standard deviation in contrast is the index of irregular loss so in the pd plot what you saw is the generalized loss was removed and the areas where there is localized depression 
these are the ones which are shown and this psd index shows the departure from the normal slope of hill of fission so higher the psd more localized the field loss the next thing is the glaucoma hemifield test it compares mirror image locations of superior and inferior retina and gives five comments ghd outside normal limits if the difference is greater than that found in 1% of the population borderline low sensitive abnormally high sensitive where there are uh, more uh, sensitive portions usually in uh, false positive uh, cases and ghd within normal limits when none of these above four conditions are met there is an additional index called the visual field index this is a global metric that represents the entire visual field as a single percentage based on normal so 100% is a fully normal field and 0% is a fully abnormal field and in between it is the percentage that the patient's field falls into so it's based largely on the pattern deviation and weighs central points more than the peripheral ones the vfi helps us to look at the rate of change over time and helps us in calculating the rate of progression so once we know that there is an abnormality one needs to have certain criterion to say that this is definitely abnormal the anderson's criteria is one that is followed quite uh, uh, you know commonly and this is what the anderson's criteria is you can refer and uh, find out but the most important thing this is that it should be correlated clinically so let's just look at a few visual fields and go through this systematic uh, process of interpreting so i will show you both the field and the disc picture to simulate a clinical scenario so first what we do is patient data and test data this is verified the patient data has has been entered and it's a 30-2 test with the ceta standard uh, the, uh, strategy reliability we look at the reliability it is quite reliable foveal sensitivity is next to be looked at the foveal sensitivity is 31.5 uh, uh, one second the foveal fovea is turned on it is 35 decibels which correlates with the visual acuity which is 69 and uh, the acuity is correlating is the blind spot located correctly see when you have the blind spot the point next to it should be zero so most probably here the blind spot has been located correctly the gray scale defects indicate a superior defect which is going in an arcuate fashion and respecting the horizontal meridian the total deviation probability plot shows uh, some amount of depression in the superior hemi field but the inferior hemi field is by and large normal but there is no generalized uh, depression there is more of a localized uh, depression which is superior and has a respect for the horizontal meridian is the fixation involved no and what does the ghd say it is outside normal limits what do the global indices say the mean deviation is very abnormal minus 13.22 and the pattern standard deviation is also very abnormal both are at p less than 0.5% anderson's criterion yes it is fulfilled there are more than 3 non edge points which are uh, abnormal and most of them are at p less than 0.5% does it correlate with the disc the most important question so you have a superior defect and you have a inferior uh, notch along with the inferior nerve fiber layer defect and so it correlates with the disc and therefore we can very confidently say that this patient has glaucoma and this is a reliable field for a disc which we are seeing again here you have uh, this uh, visual field and the um, sorry yeah you have this visual field and the disc so here again patient data and test data they are uh, verified you have some amount of false negatives but these are not very high and the uh, foveal sensitivity is 34 correlates with the visual acuity blind spot is located correctly here and the lower point is zero and gray scale again you have defects which are along the horizontal meridian inferior nasally in the td plot is there some amount of generalized loss yes there is some loss over here also but pattern deviation probability plot there is a localized depression here and it respects the horizontal meridian and is in the nasal field so it is a nasal step is the fixation involved no and what does the ghd say it is outside normal limits and global indices are also abnormal md and psd is the anderson criteria fulfilled greater than 3 non edge points abnormal in a clinically relevant area yes it is fulfilled does the disc correlate with your visual fields yes because here you are seeing some amount of superior 
rim loss which is correlating with the inferior nasal visual field defect that you are seeing so here again this patient definitely has glaucoma and this field is a proper one for a baseline field so again let us look at uh, this particular example patient data and uh, the test data again ceta standard verified and uh, false negatives are slightly at, uh, you know 11% but still it is a reliable field foveal sensitivity is 35 correlates with 6 by 9 blind spot is located correctly it is here uh, so that is not uh, a problem the patient head has been you know uh, positioned correctly gray scale defects there is some amount of defect here in the superior hemi field but doesn't reach up to the horizontal meridian total deviation probability plot so you can see that uh, there is not much of a generalized loss more of a localized loss because the total deviation and pattern deviation plots are very similar and uh, this is in the superior hemi field but does not come down to the horizontal meridian and does not widen as it is com coming nasally is the fixation involved no ghd is outside normal limits md is abnormal psd is also abnormal anderson's criteria is technically fulfilled but look at the clinical criterion which is correlation with the visual field with the disc picture so does this disc correlate with this field the inferior rim is healthy the isn't rule is followed so no it doesn't correlate with the visual field so there must be something wrong it needs further testing or we need to look at this more detail so this particular patient had ptosis and once we did the lid taping you can see that that superior defect largely disappears and this field is showing only generalized loss and the pattern deviation plot is by and large normal which correlates with this disc that we are seeing here so the next uh, visual field again patient data verified reliable test foveal sensitivity correlates with visual acuity blind spot is located correctly gray scale defect shows a superior defect which is respecting the horizontal meridian td plot and pd plot are very similar so there is only a, uh, a localized depression in the superior hemi field is the fixation involved e yes it is very near fixation over here because these two points are single digit numbers or zero so this particular patient should preferably undergo a 10 dash 2 testing to look at the central 10 degrees in more detail ghd obviously will be outside normal limits and md and psd will be abnormal anderson's criteria is also fulfilled and this here which shows inferior rim loss correlates with the visual fields and therefore again this is a field where glaucoma is definitely present so these are just a few examples whenever you look at a visual field look at whether there is an abnormality is this an artifact as a, or a real abnormality and next ask you is the abnormality consistent with the diagnosis of glaucoma in that the complete examination of the patient and correlating the field with the clinical findings is what is most important because there are many many scotoma traps in a perimetrist way so there are lot of defects which can mimic glaucoma there there are various diseases like neurological diseases retinal artery or vein occlusions which can mimic defects which are very similar to those found in glaucoma there's no time to show all of those so one should correlate with the clinical findings and that is the most important thing to take home thank you very much Uh, sorry i was muted uh, dr gauri that was a amazing talk we could have all sat and heard you for one more hour and with rapt attention uh, dr harsh would you like to take on the questions dr harsh you need to unmute okay yeah there are some quick questions uh, so i think it should be asked the panel or the person who's presenting Uh, you can ask in the person. Okay. Uh, yeah. At, uh, right now, I think we can just check with Gauri. Gauri, what is the minimum vision required? Kritika has asked, what is the minimum required uh, vision required to get a reasonable, uh, good visual field? Gauri, are you there? Unmute, Gauri. 
yeah 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 i'm unmuted technically even a one and a half to two meters counting finger patient two by 60 is enough but one would need to increase the target size to size five so whenever you have visual acuity like 660 or uh, 636 one would go on to a size five target and uh, map the visual field Okay, one quick question to Dr. Vinay. I think he must be going to take exams. The PGs are asking, how mm -hmm. important is it to remember the DDLS score? The disc, uh, <coughs> this thing, is it actually practical or is it uh, just, uh, I think we, we are just taking the last uh, one also for the disc. Is, is that me you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah Vinay. Yes, yes, Vinay. I, I actually, I have to, I'm a little embarrassed, but I have to tell you, I've not really used the DDLS score. Yeah, I, I, that's why I asked <laughs> because, you. Because, <laughs> you know, when you, I, I think that the score is important as you're evolving as a glaucoma specialist, as a student, as a fellow, because it helps you focus on features of the optic disc, actually. And then it right. takes you further forwards in evaluating a disc and the patient of glaucoma. But I think after several years of being in it, I think everything just happens subconsciously that you look at the disc and you look at everything else and the perimetry and OCT, and then you take a decision. So I think that when you're growing as a glaucoma specialist and, and when you're trying to understand the disc, and I would just like to take, your, uh, take all of you to what uh, Dr. Surinder Pandav uh, did with the GON project actually, where he showed that you know you probably need around 15 to 20 years uh, uh, looking at the disc to really reach a level where one would say now we can rely on your impression of the optic disc in glaucoma. <laughs> so I think it's it's really important initially to use this to to firm up your uh, ability to assess the optic disc actually. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gauri. One quick question for you last. Yes, sir. Uh, FDT and swap. Somebody has asked, uh, what is the relevance of FDT and swap in today's world? Yeah, FDT had a lot of promise when it came uh, because it's a very quick test, very patient friendly test. But I think the CETA and CETA fast strategies have made the Humphrey standard threshold perimetry also quite approachable. So as the octopus, so I think more as a research tool and not as a clinical tool. Coming to the blue and yellow perimetry, this is also quite difficult to do and has a lot of variability in thresholds, even in the normal population. So again, I would see, say as value as a research tool and not as a day-to-day -day clinical applicability tool. Dr. Gauri, how would you... Uh, tell like you know when you do fields on different machines they do not correlate can you yeah uh, we cannot uh, see the decibel numbers definitely we cannot look at one printout and the other the standard perimeters like the octopus and the humphrey they give very good results but uh, the quality of the results depends on the normative database so that would be good for machines which have a robust normative database so the octopus and humphrey are few of them so that is what determines the uh, result that you get. So the machine so is as good the as the normal till the, database. The patient, some of the patients will bring you five printouts from five different machines. Yeah, yeah. And now they have come to you. And so is there <laughs> any way you will be able to correlate them in some fashion? Uh, see, if I can do it with the perimeter that I use, I would preferably do the field again with the perimeter that I am used to interpreting. But in the absence of that, I would look at the field which correlates you know, more with the clinical data, the disk that I am seeing, if I have to make do with those printouts, if that is what you are asking, and I'll yeah. go by the field which correlates with the disk. But Humphrey and Octopus, these are the two printouts that I rely upon, not okay. much of the others. Okay, Dr. Barun, uh, what is the uh, smallest age where you are able to get a reliable visual field? That, uh, yeah, thank you. I, I, I really can't tell you exactly what the uh, smallest is, but it, uh, at 10 years onwards, most of the child, they are cooperative if it is a short test. And just to answer one more, qu the previous question, that the different machines has got no value if the patient comes because the field has got two purposes to serve in, in glaucoma. One is the diagnosis initial, and the second is follow -up progression. So progression, mm -hmm. you cannot judge because decibel value are not coinciding with the exact number with different machines. And that's why even different machine also cannot be the same machine, but then done at different, different places on same machine. Also, I don't prefer because then you don't have a stat pack analysis for that and the follow-up strategy in that. So that, that probably I will add. But about the age, 
it it's a really variable but then 10 years onwards i always try and uh, many, most of the time i succeed i think we shall um, thank you very much dr varun nayak we shall go on to our next speaker <clears throat> because of paucity of time our next speaker is dr murlidhar you could get your uh, slides uh, on dr murlidhar uh, would be telling us on the intricacies of reading an oct print out he is presently the consultant glaucoma neuro ophthalmology at dai foundation coimbatore after a fellowship at rp center and moran sai center salt lake city an extremely patient and one of the most popular surgeons of a hospital he has always had a keen interest in dealing with refractory glaucomas and developing safe surgical systems he has conducted innumerable instruction courses and has many publications in peer reviewed journals on to you dr murli uh, thank you very much madam and uh, good morning everybody uh, i'll be talking on oct in glaucoma so the need for oct stems from the need for a pre metric diagnosis it is well known that there should be at least a 20% diffuse ganglion cell loss or 40% focal ganglion cell loss for a field defect to develop so it is known that rnfl thinning precedes the development of field loss by up to 4 years in 35% of individuals and by 8 years in up to 19% of the individual so if you are able to diagnose a uh, glaucomatous damage before the development of a field defect you have a head start The OCT was originally developed for retinal use by Tano and Fujimoto. It is based on the principle of an optical reflectometry, and is based on the principle that different biological tissues have different light reflecting properties. Uh, so, this different light reflecting properties is used to uh, is used to generate an in vivo non invasive cross sectional imaging. Please remember that the echo delay time is of the order of femtoseconds. The echo delay time is not directly measured. It is measured by Fourier transformation and optical interferometry. The first OCT was commercially available OCT was a time domain OCT. It used a movable reference mirror. Light from a low coherent light source, a super super luminescent diode, was uh, split by a beam splitter. One beam going to the eye, the other to a movable reference mirror, and the interference pattern from the two were used to generate the echo delay time. The movable reference mirror restricted the scan speed to 400 a scans per second. The subsequent generation of OCT was a spectral domain OCT, which used a fixed reference mirror and used a spectrometer instead to split the wavelength. This greatly increased the scan speed to twenty-seven thousand a scans per second. And the latest in the pipeline is the swept source OCT, which also uses a fixed uh, reference mirror, does away with a, a spectrometer. Instead, uh, the wavelength spans across a narrow beam of wavelengths. It uses a high-speed detector, reaching scan speeds of one lakh a scans per minute. The Uh, per second, the advantage of having a high uh, scan speed is to reduce motion artifacts and improve the resolution. The axial resolution of currently available devices is of the order of five micrometers. So, just a brief note on the histology. This is the choroid. This is the histology of the optic nerve head. This is the choroid. This would be the Brooks membrane. All machines estimate the position of the optic disc by the termination of the Brooks membrane and the margin of the cup as the termination of the internal limiting membrane. This is for the ganglion cell analysis, the histology of the fovea. Please note that the foveola does not have any ganglion cell layer. A quick uh, a note on the technology: the OCT in glaucoma it measures the RNFL. There are three parts of it. One is the RNFL analysis, one is the optic nerve head analysis, and the third is the ganglion cell analysis. We need to uh, correlate all three with the clinical uh, picture, and also to correlate uh, one among the other. So the RNFL analysis it measures the RNFL thickness on a 3.46 uh, millimeter scan circle. This is an arbitrary scan circle that was originally started on the time domain OCT, and the current generations of machines have retained it. This is centered on the Brooks membrane opening, and it has 200 horizontal uh, B scans, each of which will have 200 A scans. So uh, the Tisnet thickness, that is the temporal superior nasal inferior temporal, I'll be covering this in the slides to come. It is depicted along the calculation circle. Please note that the normative database for most of these machines. is only present for uh, patients above 18 years of age and for refractive errors spanning between minus 8 to plus 4 diopters so this was what i was talking so the rnfl thickness is measured on a 3.46 mm circle different machines have different ways of doing this so in this machine the cirrus oct it's measured in a clockwise direction a total of 256 data points are taken and it is stretched along a tisnet graph So, the Tisnet graph typically shows a double hump, representing that the uh, nerve fiber layer thickness at the poles is the maximum. Anything in green is considered to be within five to ninety-five percent of the normative database. 
the avanti oct recalculates the thickness along uh, 3.46 mm it actually images an emphas image between 2.54 and the manufacturer claims that this adds more accuracy because the 3.46 mm circle was an arbitrary circle so the optic nerve head analysis is uh, started by uh, the brooks membrane opening this is the brooks membrane if you see this is the choroid and this is the brooks membrane the brooks membrane opening is taken as the disc margin the termination of ilm is taken as the um, margin of the cup and the neuroretinal rim area is calculated by the brooks membrane opening to the minimum uh, rim width this is said to have a great uh, value in distinguishing non glomerulus from glomerulus uh, optic nerve damage so a brief note on the macular ganglion cell analysis the importance stems from the fact that ganglion cell layers are affected very frequently in glaucoma and 50% of the retinal ganglion cells are located at the macula Six to eight layers uh, are made of retinal ganglion cells in the macula, and this accounts for thirty to thirty-five percent thickness of the macula. So the importance lies in the fact that measurement has very low variability. There are less artifacts and variation. The problem is that these ganglion cell layers are uh, have very low refractivity. The time domain OCT failed to image these, but the current spectral domain and source OCTs can very well image this. The Avanti OCT images all three, that is the RNFL, the ganglion cell, and the inner plexiform layer, which make up the axon and cell body and dendrites. The Zeiss OCT images the GCL and IPL. The reason why I have put this is because the uh, ganglion cell uh, analysis across machines cannot be comparable. It said that the infratemporal sector is uh, very vulnerable to damage, and ganglion cell analysis can be affected by macular disease. So the current systems you have the Cirrus uh, OCT, uh, which can reach scan speeds of twenty-seven thousand, and uh, the Avanti wide field OCT, which can reach scan speeds of seventy thousand a scans per second. So we'll uh, straight away go to reading a single printout. Please note that these have three color codes, which we need to uh, be familiar with. The color code A, which is for three, it is based on the retinal color coding schema. The hotter colors are uh, hotter colors represent thicker RNFL layers, and the cooler colors represent thinner RNFL layers. the color code a does is has got no relation to the normative database now i'll go to the regions of the oct which have the color code b so the color code b is present in the retinal deviation map in the tisnet graph and uh, this one is also this one zone one is very important other than verifying the patient demographics and also that the current patient has been imaged you need to look at the signal strength i'll mention the optimal signal strength in the slides to come then number 2 is the key parameter this is the avanti oct printout number 2 is the key parameters uh, table it has got two regions one is the rnfl analysis which gives you the average rnfl thickness uh, rn superior inferior rnfl and the asymmetry you don't have to remember the color code b it is already given here if uh, the region is in green it represents that it is above it is between 5 to 95% of the normative database if it is in yellow it is borderline that is 1 to 5% and if it is in uh, red it is less than 1% this is the optic nerve head analysis in the key parameter table this uh, shows the cup disc ratio the cup disc vertical horizontal ratio rim area all this you have to uh, note please note that this may not correlate with what you see clinically because uh, the oct marks the margin of the optic disc on the brooks membrane opening and uh, the margin of the cup on the ilm termination so uh, the region 3 uh, as i already told you is the rnfl thickness map this is based on color code a so uh, the retinal nerve fiber layers are thickest at the poles so if you see here um, there is a bifid uh, first and foremost i want to point out that please do not interpret anything on the oct because the signal strength is suboptimal but i'll just go through all these regions so uh, it shows that the rnfl layer is split actually this is a very important thing because there are two peaks in the tisnet graph i'll cover this also the next is the rnfl deviation map uh, which uh, is on color code b so again here again it follows the same schema it's given here anything in green i mean anything that doesn't have any color is normal and anything in yellow is borderline that is between 1 to 5% and anything in red uh, is probably uh, probably abnormal it constitutes less than 1% of the normative database so region 5 is the tisnet graph so in the tisnet graph it is supposed to fit into the double hump please note that we normally assume that the rnfl uh, comes in two bundles at both the poles this may not always be true that could be a shifted peak in myops the peak could be shifted a little temporarily and in some cases the rnfl may come in two bundles this is what is shown as two peaks so sometimes this dip here this trough here may come to the yellow region it may just be a normal variant so six is the, the extracted uh, horizontal tomogram of the optic disc you need to see whether there are any artifacts whether there are any vitreo retinal uh, traction etc and the same thing in uh, the avanti oct the rnfl deviation map is represented like this 
So again, the red green uh, colors represent what I've already told you. The vessels are removed, and it also shows the optic disc. This is a, uh, and uh, it also gives you the cross section of the optic disc in horizontal as well as vertical. You need to see all this just to make sure that your scan is proper. Right. So uh, when you when it comes to reading a single printout for the Zeiss OCT, you need to have a quality score of six or better. And for the Avanti OCT, you need a quality score of more than 35. The manufacturer actually recommends a scan score of more than 40. So the key parameters table, please note uh, that this is very important because if only the RNFL is affected and the optic nerve head parameters are normal, you need to uh, go back at your diagnosis and see if you are uh, looking at something non glaucomatous So the three is the RNFL thickness map. I already told you that uh, this is color code A. Please look for any splitting or any shifted peaks and also look for centration of the optic disc. And if there are any black areas like these, especially if they are within the calculation circle, they have not been imaged. So you need to be uh, very careful while interpreting uh, these. And this is a printout from the Avanti OCT. So here the superior RNFL seems okay. There is a loss of the inferior RNFL because if you see the RNFL here is blue in color. Blue means thinner. So this is well within the calculation circle. And the Tisner graph also correlates with uh, your damage. The Tisner graph actually spreads this out. As I have already told you, it spreads this out into a line. It is supposed to fit into the green area of the double zone. And uh, here you can clearly see that uh, starting uh, here, it's uh, into the red zone. Possibly there is an inferior uh, new fiber layer loss. This has to be correlated clinically as well as with the visual. So the RNFL deviation map in the uh, Zeiss OCT. So it has three um, circles here. The black represents the margin of the optic disc, the red, the cup, and this violet, the uh, RNFL calculation circle. Anything in white is normal. Anything in yellow is uh, borderline, that is 1 to 5% of the normative database. And uh, anything in red is less than 1%. So this is how, this is the mathematics part of it as to how the machine actually uh, calculates, uh, actually images. It's in a 6 by 6 millimeter cube centered on the Brooks membrane. So, right, so this is the TISNET plot, as I have already told you. There are uh, 256 data points. And uh, you need to check for artifacts here. Here again, as I said, there is a dip here. So this could represent a split RNFL. You need to go back uh, and look at the RNFL thickness map to see if it's a split RNFL. So this dip into the red region may not necessarily be abnormal. This is from the uh, Avanti OCT. And you can clearly see uh, that the superior part of the uh, nerve fiber layer is normal. And here, again, it goes dipping into the red zone. So this is a circular tomogram. It's preferable to have this color coded. Some machines don't have it. It's a raw OCT image on which the segmentation, the segmentation I'll show you on subsequent slides to come. The segmentation uh, is the, I mean, there are two boundaries that are placed on the RNFL, automatically placed on the RNFL. And you need to check for any artifacts, any segmentation error, you know, uh, something like a, a wise ring or asteroid hylosis could block this imaging and that could be shadowing on, on the RNFL tomogram, which means that again, the data is not very really reliable. So it's very tempting to conclude uh, that this is a very advanced glaucomatous optic uh, nerve damage. If you see, uh, there is diffuse RNFL thinning. And this was the segmentation that I was talking about. You can see two lines here. So this is where the RNFL is measured. So it's very tempting to conclude that the RNFL is thin. The RNFL deviation map uh, shows so much of nerve fiber loss. This is called the sector uh, graph. This is the upper and lower sector. And this is split into four sectors, all in red. Both the optic nerve head and RNFL parameters are here uh, in red. But if you notice that the signal strength is so uh, bad here, it's 29. And if you see that the retinal vasculature is hardly imaged. So uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, even if the signal strength is good, you need to look at the retinal vasculature because sometimes that could be a break in the retinal vasculature, which could represent a motion artifact. So now we'll go to the ganglion cell analysis. Ganglion cell analysis is a 6 by 6 millimeter macular cube centered on the fovea. We'll have to go faster, Muldi, running late. Yes, madam. So uh, centered on the fovea, the Avanti uses a 7 by uh, 7 uh, millimeter cube. So uh, this gives a pano, uh, pano, pantomap analysis that is the optic nerve head and this place side by side. I'll just go very fast here. The NDB refers to the normative database. There is a central hole here because the foveola is devoid of any ganglion cells. This uh, occurs in the Zeiss OCT as well. And the same color code B that is yellow is borderline and red is abnormal. I'll point out two, um, key, uh, two parameters in the key parameters table and I'll wrap up my presentation. This is for the Zeiss. This is how it looks on the Zeiss OCT. And... Um, yeah, there are two parameters. One is the focal loss volume and the global loss volume, which are said to be very sensitive to early detection of glaucoma. Please note that the ganglion cell analysis and RNFL thickness may not always correlate with each other. The RNFL thickness uh, is primarily influenced by the nerve fiber layer at the poles and the ganglion cell contributes to uh, ganglion cell 
so in the macula contribute to the papillomacular bundle so they may be affected independently of each other so the focal loss volume is uh, calculated as the integral of deviation in areas of significant focal gcc and global loss volume uh, for the entire uh, area and um, this uh, just wanted to show the segmentation error uh, on the spectralis oct uh, so if you notice here there's hardly any segmentation on the uh, nerve fiber layer here and uh, so really this oct uh, cannot be relied upon this is because of uh, you know a lot of gliosis on the optic disc high myopia again more than minus 8 it is influenced uh, by lack of a normative database please note that the depth of focus of the machine is only 2 mm in high myopia uh, that is more than 6 uh, to 8 uh, more than 8 diopters the wall is stretched unevenly so in many regions it goes beyond uh, the depth of depth of focus of the machine and uh, there are a lot of peripapillary that could be peripapillary atrophy pvd and corioretinal degeneration all of which uh, may influence so uh, once again oct in high myopia has uh, is not really something that we can uh, uh, fall back on this is pseudo exfoliation glaucoma if you notice that uh, both the rnfl and the gcc show advanced damage here whereas, whereas the left um, eye which uh, has pseudo exfoliation but no glaucoma the parameters are in the normal range and uh, this is once again, uh, this shows moderate uh, damage glaucoma. If you see the Tisnet graph dipping here, there is RNFL thinning here and all parameters in uh, red and the left, there is a flow effect. That is the whole Tisnet graph is in the um, uh, is uh, in the red zone. This is again, uh, once again, I ju I'll just wrap up with this slide. So this patient has a junctional scotoma. There is central scotoma here and a hemifield defect here. So there's advanced GCC loss in patients with non-glaucomatous visual field. It's very important to look at the GCC. There is a complete loss of uh, ganglion cells in the area of central. This patient had a pituitary macroadenoma and uh, there's diffuse loss. And if you see the nasal uh, portion is affected here, but if you look at the tomogram, the fovea has not been imaged. So once again, um, this is a patient with bitemporal hemi hemianopia and uh, the RNFL thickness is normal, but the GCC shows uh, nasal loss by nasal thinning. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Yes, Chitra, you are heard. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh. Dr. Harsh, you have any question to ask before yeah. we go on? Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, Murli, uh, uh, sorry, the, would there be a situation where OCT is normal, but the field or the disc is glaucometer? So can you have a situation where the OCT is normal? Uh, yes, sir. That could happen sometimes it does happen sometimes so uh, i have had uh, occasions on which uh, uh, you know the oct has been normal but the field uh, the field has shown uh, some defects and the clinical picture is also consistent with this this uh, could happen partly because the, the normative database of these machines is restricted to 300 to 500 the avanti oct is said to have 1000 so sometimes yes it could uh, happen sir uh, possibly because of uh, uh, and that is why the sensitivity of the OCT has never been above 70 to 80 percent. Apart from that, uh, in uh, retinal condition, there could be some uh, epiretinal membrane or uh, you know macular edema that may push up the thickness or peripapillary uh, edema that may push up the thickness uh, in these uh, patients. So uh, it may artifactually be abnormal. Okay, I think we can go ahead, Chitra. Uh, uh, our Dr. Tanush Jada is going to be our next speaker. Mulli, you did talk very well. I, my, I had a signal loss, so I missed some of it. Oh. Dr. Tanuj is going to be talking to us on a very critical topic, understanding primary angle closure disease. An amazing personality. He needs no introduction. He is a professor at RP Center, Sec uh, Secretary International Society of Glaucoma Surgery, Senior Chair Associate Advisory Board of Directors of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society, Chief Editor Journal of Current Practice and Associate Editor Journal of Glaucoma. And on all top of this has over 300 index publications to his credit. And I think we are very, very sure to have the right person who is going to explain primary angle closure disease in the best way possible. On to you, Dr. Tanush. Thank you, Madam Chitra. So for those of you who are interested in learning about this disease, the All India Ophthalmic Society has published these guidelines for the diagnosis and management of primary angle closure disease. So you can contact the secretariat and have these guidelines for a detailed overview. Now, why is it important to understand about 
the angle soldier disease because it affects nearly 20 million people worldwide and although the ratio of open angle to angle closure is 1 is to 3 the ratio of blindness is 1 is to 1 so angle closure glaucoma carries three fold excess risk of bilateral visual impairment as compared to primary open angle glaucoma now what exactly do you mean by primary angle closure so in a normal eye you have the ciliary body producing aqueous which goes and exit from the trabecular meshwork so in primary angle closure you have a physical obstruction of the trabecular meshwork by the iris tissue so this is known as angle closure now if you see from a gonioscopic point of view this is an open angle you can see the trabecular meshwork and behind that the ciliary spur and this is an angle closure because the iris has now occluded the area of the trabecular meshwork and close the flow of aqueous on the asocd you can see a completely open angle and here you can see the iris is closing the angle so this is known as angle closure so once you put in a gonioscope this shows an open angle you can see the iris the trabecular meshwork the ciliary body band it's a wide open angle and if you see the video at the bottom none of the angle structures are visible because the iris is obstructing the trabecular meshwork this is an open angle and this is what we are dealing with angle closure now why does angle closure occur the basic mechanism is that you have a contact between the iris and the trabecular meshwork reducing the drainage of aqueous the pathophysiology is basically majority of the cases there is a pupillary block mechanisms however some cases you might also have a plateau iris in which there is a thickened ciliary body you get this classical sine wave configuration or a thick peripheral iris blocking the trabecular meshwork and in many cases you may have a increase in the lens thickness or a anteriorly displaced lens which is now quantified by what is known as the lens vault the predisposing factors causing angle closure include a shallow anterior chamber shorter axial length smaller corneas thicker iris a thicker lens and a anteriorly placed lens in addition you have physiological factors precipitating angle closure such as dim light near work stress the well salva maneuver and it may be induced by midriatic we use for dilatation in the clinic the basic pathology physiology is according to the mapstone theory when the iris in dim illumination becomes mid dilated the posterior vector of the iris is maximum and that is what causes the pupillary block mechanism now how to classify patients of angle closure it is basically classified into four broad categories the angle closure suspects primary angle closure glaucoma and acute attack of angle closure so what is a primary angle closure suspect in these patients on gonioscopy there is evidence of irido trabecular contact more than 180 degrees the trabecular meshwork is not visible however there is no synechia formation no rise in intraocular pressure and there are no disc changes so you put in a gonioscope you see the the trabecular meshwork is not visible then you manipulate and you see now the ciliary spur has become visible so this is a occludable angle which is opening up on manipulation this is a patient who is primary angle closure suspect now coming to the second category that is primary angle closure in these patients you have an irotrabecular contact but you have now presence of peripheral anterior synechia and you may or may not have a rise in intraocular pressure there are no disc changes this is functional damage so in primary angle closure you put in a gonioscope and you will see the iris touching the trabecular meshwork this is the trabecular meshwork and you have iris at points touching the trabecular meshwork so this is peripheral anterior synechia or gonio synechia formation and that is how you classify this patient as having a primary angle closure as the disease progresses you have the synechia arise in iop and now glaucomatous optic neuropathy sets in so this is known as primary angle closure glaucoma at this stage none of the angle structures are visible the angle is completely closed and you can see a very steep iris configuration so in summary you have 
अक्रूटिबर एंगल्स पी एस सी एस प्लस साइनिकिया पी एस सी प्लस राइज इन इंट्राक्ल प्रेशर विच इज नोन एज पी एस सी ऑक्ल हाइपर टेंशन प्लस ऑप्टिक नर्व हेड चेंजेस वेन यू लेबल इट एज प्राइमरी एंगल क्लोजर ग्लोकोमा वॉट आर द इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट टू बी नोटेड इन द हिस्ट्री एंड एग्जामिनेशन इन एंडीशन टू द सिम्टम सच एज कलर हेडलोस रेडनेस हेडेक you must take a history of the drug induced angle closure many patients are taking anticholinergic tofrid medicine antidepressants which can cause pupillary dilatation and precipitate angle closure and you have some drugs such as the topiramate and the astazolamide which can cause idiosyncratic reaction so you must rule out drug induced angle closure in any patient who presents with symptoms of primary angle closure initial signs you can see the absent the pupillary shadow on the oblique torch light illumination absence of the pupillary ruff the von herrick grading the iris the peripheral anterior chamber depth but the critical sign is that you must do a gonioscopy and document whether the iris is plugging the trabecular mesh fork or no there can be no diagnosis of angle closure without gonioscopy do you require to do ubm or asoct routinely they are not required only if you get an iris cyst formation or a plateau iris configuration are these investigations required not on a routine basis what about is there any role of provocative testing the answer is no there is no room of dark room or midriatic test because these tests have a poor sensitivity a negative test does not rule out angle closure and you are putting the patient at risk of an acute attack now once you diagnose angle closure disease what is the treatment so when you have pac and pacg you must do laser eye dot me but when you have a angle closure suspect pacs you you do not require eye dot me routinely however if the fellow eye has pac or pacg if the patient requires repeated dilatation like diabetic patient or is using one of the systemic medications causing pupillary dilatation if there is a family history of angle closure glaucoma if there is progressive narrowing on yearly gonioscopy if the patient cannot come for follow up and wants an iridotomy then these are indications when you can go ahead and do iridotomy in primary angle closure suspect and also in one eyed patients now once you have done the iridotomy is the story over no because after iridotomy it has been demonstrated that nearly 60% of patients still may have contact between the iris and the trabecular meshwork and the disease may progress so primary angle closure suspect nearly 22% of the patients can progress over 5 years and primary angle closure nearly 1/3 can progress over 5 years and if you have ocular hypertension that is the highest risk of progression to glaucomatous optic neuropathy so what are the objectives of surgical therapy you have to reduce the intraocular pressure but in addition if you can reopen the closed angle and prevent progressive angle closure that will be very beneficial so the conventional management any patient comes with primary angle closure disease you, you do a laser iridotomy and then treat as if patient has open angle glaucoma if the pressure is not controlled you go ahead and do a trabeculectomy trabeculectomy is basically done if the patient has a uncontrolled glaucoma and is not compliant or allergic to medicines an important point i want to emphasize if you are pushing the patient towards surgery you must try pilocarpine in angle closure pilocarpine works quite well and you may be able to avoid surgery if you use pilocarpine in these patients now the other modality which is now become very popular is the lens extraction and why this has become popular because it handles all three mechanisms it relieves the pupillary block it takes away the lens volume and also can help with the plateau iris and the second option that we have is trabeculectomy and trabeculectomy is a very serious surgery and you have to be very careful before doing trabeculectomy in a patient angle closure this is a patient recently referred to us angle closure glaucoma trap done now you have a shallow ac and a an intumescent lens and doing a cataract surgery in this patient is fraught with complications and you can get a endothelial corneal decompensation so when you do a trap always give pre operative mannitol there is a higher risk of complications you must use releasable sutures trap in angle closure glaucoma 
and doing a phaco emulsification in these eyes requires an expertise which is not routinely available for a normal phaco surgeon now you have done the pi and the pressure is not controlled so what do you do you start medical therapy including pyrocarpine and your surgical therapy will depend upon the stage of the disease patient factors affordability accessibility and what is your own surgical expertise so you divide the patients into three categories early glaucoma moderate glaucoma severe glaucoma based on the visual field defect of the optic nerve cupping early glaucoma you can go ahead with lens extraction however once patient reaches moderate to advanced glaucoma where you require low target pressure trabecectomy has to be performed because this sustains the long term intraocular pressure what about patient presenting with angle closure glaucoma and cataract so if there is a early field defect or a cupping of 0.7 or less you can just do a plain phaco emulsification once the patient has a moderate field defect or 0.7 to 0.9 cupping you can do a first stage phaco emulsification and if the iop is not controlled subsequently do a second stage trabecectomy if a patient cannot come for follow up you should do a phaco trap and in patients who present with advanced glaucoma you must always do a combined surgery in the form of phaco trabecectomy now what about patients who have got this disease without cataract this is still a controversial issue but in this study you can see phaco versus trap the iop reduction is quite good with both procedures but the complications are much higher with trabecectomy and also one third of the patients are going to develop cataract which is going to require subsequent lens surgery should we do the trap first followed by phaco or the phaco first followed by trap so this is something i want you to be clear on you should always do the phaco first followed by trabecectomy if possible because cataract surgery can compromise the bleph function and lead to failure what is the role of a new procedure called gonio synechoelysis so here under the gonioscope you take away the peripheral integral synechia from the area of the trabecular meshwork this can be done with the viscoelastic or with the blunt spatula so is there any role of gonio synechoelysis the answer is no we found that there is no benefit of adding gonio synechoelysis to routine phaco emulsification for angle closure so to summarize the management of primary angle closure glaucoma for early cases a lens extraction alone with a temporal phaco emulsification is sufficient you cannot do do a superior sics because that area should be available for a subsequent trabecectomy so in, in patient with primary angle closure or early pacg you can go ahead with lens extraction but you must monitor the post of iop spikes and give medications to control the iop if the pressure is not controlled you can plan for a second stage trabecectomy however once the patient gets a moderate to advanced glaucoma in which the iop is not controlled on medications patient cannot come for follow up or has duck allergy or is a poor patient you must do a trabecectomy plus minus a phaco trabecectomy in these patients so take home message on primary angle closure disease in the history you must rule out drug induced angle closure gonioscopy is mandatory without that you should not treat a patient laser iridotomy is a first step whatever the stage of acg if the pressure is not medic medically controlled use pilocarpine if you are going in for surgery in early glaucoma or pac you can try lens extraction and control the pressure with medical therapy however once the patient reaches moderate to advanced glaucoma you must do trabecectomy whether you can combine it with cataract surgery and give preoperative mannitol and must use releasable sutures so that is in summary the management and take home message for primary angle closure disease thank you very much for your kind attention thank you dr tanuj for making that uh, topic so interesting for all of us it was uh, very nice I really enjoyed your talk i am not sure dr harsh do we have time for any question or shall we go on because we have got still whole lot of speakers okay okay go ahead we'll ask in the end yeah yeah we have some good questions for dr tanuj we'll take it up uh, i introduce our next speaker dr shushmita kaushik who's going to be talking on medical management of glaucoma for all of us dr shushmita could you get your slides
She's another very major pillar of ophthalmology and the professor of ophthalmology at PGI Chandigarh. Is she on mute? Can Dr. you, can you see my slides? Hi. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Chitra. Can you yeah. see my slides uh, I've shared? Yeah. She's a professor of ophthalmology at PGI Chandigarh with 10, 20 years of amazing experience in glaucoma and has keen interest in imaging, glaucoma surgery, and childhood glaucoma. She's, I was just amazed to read her bio data. She's an invited member of Childhood Glaucoma Research Network, was a faculty in preparing the consensus on childhood glaucoma globally, is a founder secretary of the Indian Pediatric Glaucoma Society, vice president of Chandigarh Ophthalmic Society, and former secretary of GSI. She has innumerable publications, is cited in Yonoff textbook, and has authored chapters in glaucoma in various textbooks, and who could have been more impressive than her for telling you all succinctly how to manage the glaucoma medically? On to uh, your... it, says screen, it says screen sharing has failed. Please try again later. I don't know what to do with this. Can you screen share uh, again? Yeah, I have. I've shared it about five, six times now. But I'm getting a message. The screen sharing has failed to start. So... Uh, Mr. Sunil? So every time I press share, it says it has failed to start. So maybe I do it again. Sushmita, can you uh, yeah. reconnect again? Leave the okay, meeting, I'll... reconnect again. And Chitra, can you go for All the right. next speaker so that uh, Sushmita yeah, can okay. get sure, ready? Sure. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll yeah. do that. Uh, yeah, we, sure. shall, uh, uh, we will be hearing you, Dr. Sushmita. Yeah. I'll yeah, ask sure. Mr. Sunil to guide you. And in the interim, we'll take on our next speaker, uh, Dr. Chandrima, who is going to be delivering uh, Chandrima, Dr. Chandrima, you have to be ready. You have to dwell on lasers in glaucoma. Glaucoma has been a great passion of Dr. Chandrima, as, is, uh, as has been for all our very renowned speakers in this session. She has been the recipient of the uh, DP Chandra Award 2006, DK Mitra Award. She's been a principal investigator of one of the largest glaucoma prevalence study and also for on anti glaucoma drugs and multinational trials for newer surgical equipments. She has been a consistent faculty of GSI, reviewer in editorial board of IJO, president Calcutta Academy of Ophthalmology, and many, many more prestigious posts. Dr. Chandrima? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Chitra. Can I share my screen? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. I've shared it, but... Uh... I think I need a little bit of help. I think everybody is having some sharing problem. So the admin has to really look what's going on. Okay, now we are we are on. Okay. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, Chandrama. The slides are on. So okay. you can go ahead. Yeah. I just need to put this down then. I don't know how to put this down. So uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra, very specially for this invite. And this is actually a very humble presentation before, uh, so to say, my teacher, Dr. Hush Kumar, because he's the doyen of lasers in glaucoma. And my job is also much easier because he would be taking all the questions when he's here. So anyway, I move on to it. A laser is a device that emits light through a process of optical amplification based on the stimulated emission of electromagnetic waves. So it's the properties are monochromatic, coherent parallelism and brightness. It actually works through photocoagulation where it, uh, it causes heat, which denatures the protein. Then it works through photo disruption where it, actually the molecules are broken and there's an explosive disruption of tissue which can create an incision and uh, photo ablation where there is vaporization of tissue. And if you look at that picture there, so the uh, photochemical effects actually uh, can cause incision and photosensitization. Then you have the thermal effects, which are used in the ND um, laser, uh, YAG laser that we use, which can cause coagulation and again incision. And you have the ionizing effects, which cause photo disruption. So the lasers in glaucoma are used in closed angle glaucoma. We have the laser PI, which Dr. Tanuj spoke about extensively, and we have the iridoplasty. In open angle glaucoma, you have the selective laser trabeculoplasty, and in uh, cytophotocoagulation, you have the transclerous cytophotocoagulation and the endocytophotocoagulation. 
So lasers in open angle glaucoma, what do they do? They uh, cause an outflow of enhancement like laser trabeculoplasty and an inflow reduction that is like cytophotocoagulation for end stage disease. Laser in angle closure cause relief of pupillary block like laser iridotomy, modification of the iris contour, thus laser trabeculoplasty and inflow reduction again, cytophotocoagulation. So lasers in post-operative treatment, we use them for laser suture lysis and post-trabeculectomy cases, laser sclerostomy and laser goniopuncture for post-non-penetrating surgery. So to talk a little about the photodisruptive NDAG laser, which is Q-switched and mode locked, it connects the anterior to the posterior chamber to relieve the pupillary block. It is relatively non-invasive and that's how uh, the animation is. And this is actually directly taken from uh, Dr. Hush Kumar's publication in the IJO and the PSCS indications Dr. Tanuj has elaborated. So I won't go through them again. PSC actually, also he has said, so uh, basically I wouldn't go through that in the interest of time. And PSCG also he has gone through and they're directly from from SIRS uh, publication in IGO. So contraindications are here, neovascular glaucoma, angle closure, uh, which causes lens-induced narrowing of the angle, drug-induced secondary angle closure, and angle narrowing caused by choroidal swelling or choroidal effusion. So uh, the patient preparation, we generally instill one person pilocarpin, maybe twice or thrice, five minutes apart, which causes meiosis and stretches the iris, which makes it uh, much more uh, uh, tougher, uh, uh, very tough uh, structure on which we can fire the laser shots very easily. And of course, we use propocaine as a surface anesthetic. The lens choice, I think most of us use the Abraham lens and we are comfortable with it. And the energy delivered, to the cornea and retina is four times less than that with the Weiss lens. And uh, about the iridotomy itself, these are the specifications, which again, I won't go through in detail in the interest of time, but uh, there is also a combined uh, procedure where you can use the diode and the YAC together. This is generally preferred in cases where there, the iris is very thick and the argon laser shots or the diode laser shots actually attenuate the iris and make it to about one fourth the original thickness and then coagulate the vessels in that area. And then you can actually go into that area. That's with the YAG laser. And this is what it looks like when you actually fire the YAG laser into that crater made by the diode. That's a, a, an anterior OCD picture. So post-laser management, we give steroids four times for seven days to reduce the inflammation. And of course, an anti-glaucoma, something like the carbonic anhydrase uh, to actually prevent any IOP spike post-laser. And we generally check the patient after seven days to uh, we see the IOP and we do a gonioscopy to see the status of the angle after the laser PI. The complications are not too many and far. Uh, actually. So uh, laser-induced inflammation, iridectomy failure, diplopia bleeding, and lens opacities. Then you have the laser peripheral iridoplasty, which actually causes an opening of the oppositional uh, closed angle. And uh, the indications are attack of angle closure. In plateau iris, it is one of the commonest indications and angle closure related to size or position of the lens. And the contraindications would be uh, advanced corneal edema opacification, flat AC, cynical angle closure, and complications would be iritis or con uh, con uh, corneal endothelial burn and transient rise in IOP. The laser trabeculoplasty, it is relatively effective, non-invasive procedure. The laser treatment to trabecular meshwork to increase the outflow by mechanical, cellular, and biochemical theories. So the, uh, generally used nowadays is the selective laser trabeculoplasty, which actually targets the pigmented uh, trabecular meshwork cells without causing thermal damage to the non-pigmented cells. And that's the uh, machine specifications which are used. And the indications are chronic open angle glaucoma, exfoliation syndrome, pigmentary glaucoma, and glaucoma in the in aphakia and pseudophakia. So the contraindications once again are closed or extremely narrow angle, corneal edema, aphakia with vitreous in anterior chamber, vascular glaucoma, and acute uveitis, primary congenital glaucoma, or angle recession. And uh, one second. So the complications again, iritis, peripheral anterior sinicare, hemorrhage, corneal complications are there. Uh, 
Lasers are also used in malignant glaucoma. The diode laser can be used. It restores the normal forward flow of echo, especially when accompanied by aggressive cycloplegias, migratics, and hyperosmotic um, agents. And it can, uh, the NDAG beam can also be used to, uh, act, it is directed to the anterior hyaline phase between the ciliary body. And uh, you can also do a posterior capsulotomy and release that. In FAKIC ciliary block glaucoma, the NDAG laser can rupture the vitreous phase and break the block. In pseudophakic uh, ciliary uh, block glaucoma as well, you can use the NDAG laser. And uh, cytophotocoagulation, the techniques are generally trans, uh, scleral, transpupillary, and endolasers. And the indication is failure of multiple filtering surgeries and uh, where surgery is not appropriate or a painful blind eye. So we have the diode laser transcleral photocoagulation, which is uh, performed with uh, uh, 810 um, NM diode laser, and we generally use about 1500 to uh, 2500 uh, milliwatt for 1.5 to 3 seconds. And then you have the endo laser cytophotocoagulation, where actually the time of exposure is based on the visual effect of the ciliary process shrinkage and whitening. So the comparisons of the two, they are comparable actually, both of them, and the complications, both of them actually have almost the same complications like high femur, IOP, spike, cataract, need of retreatment. So then we move on to the carbon dioxide laser assisted sclerostomy, which actually did not gain much of a popularity, it is almost same as trabeculectomy. So after you've made the scleral flap, you basically use the carbon dioxide laser probe, uh, probe there and uh, over the trabecular meshwork to dissect until the aqueous actually percolates. And the drawbacks are it's relatively a very steep learning curve and demands careful and delicate surgery. Then we have laser suture lysis, which we regularly use post uh, uh, trabeculectomy. And we have reopening of failed filtration sites, which are also uh, regularly used by us. The Q-switched ND laser uh, can actually vaporize uh, and make an opening out there where there is an obstruction, ob obstruction in the sclerostomy and the single burst actually can be used to do it. It's quite simple. And about the femtolaser, actually, uh, I have a very personal experience with the femtolaser because I have been using it for over almost a year now for cataract surgery, but then I would not actually use it at this moment for uh, glaucoma surgery because I did try it and it was very disappointing because the LOI, that is the... Uh, the liquid interface which it requires actually does not provide for uh, trabeculectomy at the moment, but we're looking forward to a time when they'll make modifications in the docking process and probably will be able to use it for uh, trabeculectomy very soon. And uh, then you have the cyclodialysis laser and you have the laser sinuculysis, which are regularly used by people who do glaucoma surgery. And the other use of lasers, goniopuncture in non-penetrating surgery, which is uh, almost becoming obsolete nowadays, non-penetrating surgery. And the blocked inner ostium can be freed, freed with the YAG laser, vitreolysis is there and modifying the bleb. So that actually completes uh, lasers in glaucoma. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that very extensive talk, which you covered everything. Dr. Satyajit, uh, can you uh, take any question of the audience to our uh, eminent panel? And I would request Dr. Shushmita to uh, get her uh, to screen share her talk. Hello? Hello, I think Dr. Chandrima has to stop, stop sharing. I'm just, I'm just trying that. Uh, so technically challenged. Just a second, dear. Yeah. yeah. Is that fine? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. You're there, Shushmita. I can see you. Yeah. Yes. And it again says it cannot. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Is it visible now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Is that visible? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. It's just very unfortunate that we have very terrific talks ahead. But we may, we are, would be obliged if you all could slightly shorten your talks, if feasible. Yeah, okay. So, uh, good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. And thank you, everybody, for having me on. So, I'm going to be talking of medical management in brief. And uh, remember, the entity that we know as glaucoma, as we've been hearing, is this chronic optic neuropathy. And the only thing that we can reduce is the raised intraocular pressure. Though remember that uh, a, raise, a pressure is neither sufficient nor necessary for a diagnosis of glaucoma. 
So having said that, we'll talk about why should we reduce? What do we have at our disposal? And uh, what are the drugs that we have and how do we go ahead? So the fundamental goal of treatment is to slow the rate of cell loss to an age dependent rate, which only means that normally uh, a normal individual would have uh, attrition of ganglion cells. A glaucomatous individual has it much faster and the more that we can do is catch it as early as possible and get glaucoma to almost anything that we can modify is the elevated pressure and remember lowering the intraocular pressure Hello, hello. Any primary, um, Dr. Tanuj has come on screen somehow. No, no, this is not my screen. Uh, uh, yeah, so if you have early POAG with the CD ratio of less than 0. 0.7, yeah, then it uh, a pressure of less than. For a moderate uh, primary open angle glaucoma with a CD ratio of 0.7 to less than 0.9 with no visual field defect in the central 10 degrees, you need a less than 15 millimeters pressures. And for advanced glaucomas of more than 0.8, you need less than 12. So the target pressure should be individualized because it does uh, depend upon the increased pressure, the stage of the disease, the life expectancy, the rate of damage, as well as the corneal thickness. But ultimately your goal should be to maintain functional vision throughout the patient's lifetime. So Paul Chandler all those years ago in the 60s said it best, eyes with advanced glaucoma require a pressure below the average with limited cupping appear to withstand pressure better and with the normal disc withstand pressures well over years. The modalities that we have are eye drops, lasers and surgeries. We are doing medical management today. So just to quickly go over what we have, we have prostaglandin analogs, we have beta adrenergic antagonists, we have oral and topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and we have alpha adrenergic agonists. And this makes the uh, basket of what we have. So what do we start with? Usually for primary open angle glaucoma, PG analogs have emerged as the best. They have maximum IOP lowering monotherapy. They have effective diurnal pressure controls. They have minimal tachyphylaxis. They have a convenient dosing regimen and few systemic safety concerns. So going on to a treatment decision, remember we start with monotherapy. If the patient is responsive, well and good, or a treatment goal is not received or they are unresponsive to treatment. Responsive means at least a 20% reduction in IOP. Anything less than that, you need to change your drug. If it's if the treatment goal, if they're responsive, you need to periodically verify the endpoints and carry on from there. Why would we like monotherapy? Because they have better compliance. And in the long run, single drugs that work more than one drug are likely to enhance it. Okay, now it's not moving. I'm sorry. Okay. So why monotherapy? Again, the washout effect is also eliminated. You can see at a 30 second interval, 45% of the drug is still there. Two minute interval, about 15% is there. And at a five minute interval, there's no drug at all. So if at all you're not giving monotherapy, be very sure that you tell the patient. That. The compliance is also better amongst all compliant patients as expected, those on one medication, 70% of those were compliant compared to just one quarter on two and very few if you raised it up to three bottles, which the patient had to put. Now, if it is so easy, what is the problem? The problem is the prostaglandin analog stone to lower IOP as much as it is required and one quarter reduction 
But if, as we said before, if it's less than 20%, you switch to another prostaglandin analog. Now, the second scenario of a monotherapy not being enough, then you need to add a second agent. It can be either fixed or an unfixed combination. Once you decide a second drug is needed, the factors you need to keep in mind is efficacy, safety and tolerability, and the convenience of dosing. So the choices for an adjunctive, once you've started a PG analog, is a beta blocker, alpha-2 agonist, topical anhydrase inhibitors, sometimes even myotics if things don't work out. Combinations available are with dorsalamide, bromonidine, with timolol, dorsalamide with bromonidine now, and that has an advantage of low timolol if you want to. So of course, the advantages of fixed combinations are dosing one drop, so one bottle, with two drugs in it. The convenience helps patient compliance. There's no risk of a washout and possibly cost savings. Now, what are the challenges to medical management? The first and foremost is non-compliance. So in this very interesting study, uh, 151 patients in a North India were interviewed, 49%, so half of them reported problems in using medication and 16% were totally non-compliant and 35% on asking to demonstrate demonstrated improper drop administration. So despite spending the money and understanding that it needs to be put, at the end of the day, drop inside the eye. And forgetfulness, surprisingly, was cited as the main reason for being non-compliant and had a significant association. So the concept of persistency, which means how, many, how much of the time do you actually put your drops, the main impacting factors were this is ideal if you have it 100%. But then after human complacency or denial of glaucoma, most people would say, no, it can't happen to me. So uh, it dropped to about 90%. With complicated dosing, it dropped to 70%. With added side effects, it dropped to even 60%. And if you had economic issues, it dropped to less than 40%. So the, the concept of consist persistency of giving medication in glaucoma is multifactorial. Then you also have the side effects to uh, be uh, patients for a trauma clinic who do not put drops simply because it's simply too painful. And benzyl conium chloride causes a dose dependent toxic effects on the ocular surface. You may have side effects of glaucoma, anti-glaucoma drugs themselves. So the uh, patients on the right have these long, long lashes with bimatopros, and this poor lady has very, very bad skin pigmentation and crusting with brimonidine. So these are factors to keep in mind apart from the pressures and might keep your pressures uncontrolled simply because the patients are not compliant enough with their drops. So let's not forget even if prostaglandin analog is not the first line, usually it's stimulol and it does cause a 20% reduction. So it's not that if a patient does not put a PGA, you cannot treat him. If it's not enough, it may make sense to substitute with the PGA if, if the stimulol is not working. Sometimes it's not advisable like uveitis or early post-op or trauma and, and as an adjuvant can achieve about 30% reduction along with it. The other things as we said are bromonidine, dorsalamide, the combinations, and of course, phylocarpy. So in a nutshell, quickly, medications, lasers, incision surgeries, they're all given lowering intraocular pressure. And you need to decide on the patient sitting in front of you, which of these you want to choose and which of these is going to result in a pressure, which is going to have a quality of life as well as a glaucoma control over the patient's lifetime. Prostaglandin analogs, are consistently superior in terms of IOP lowering ability and the adverse effect profile, but they're not the only things that you have in your armamentarium. You're less likely, patients who are treated medically or surgically, they're less likely to experience progression of visual field loss and optic nerve damage versus those who receive no treatment. So you must treat them as much as you can. Thank you.
Hello, uh, Dr. Shushmita, can you hear yeah. me? Yes, yes, uh, I can. That hear was you. a wonderful yeah. talk. Thank uh, you. Really succinct and uh, very informative. Um, I think we'll go on to our next speaker, Dr. Krishna Das, who's going to be talking on trabeclectomy, the approach. A most admired person, personality in Indian ophthalmology. He's a senior consultant in Glaucoma and Arvindai Hospital, Madurai. Actively involved in patient care, training, clinical research over the past three decades, doing human service to society. He has co-authored many publications in glaucoma, epidemiology, and clinical trials. And we really look forward to hearing you, Dr. Krishna Das. Hello? Hello? Is Dr. Krishna Das muted? Dr. Krishna Das, can you unmute? Sorry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. And is the screen seen? The screen is seen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chitra, for that introduction. And I think every ophthalmologist here in the symposium is uh, very well admired and appreciated. Okay going on for the filtering surgery and its role in uh, glaucoma management. Now the filtering surgeries uh, are uh, essentially by full thickness about 100 years back and then they had become guarded filtration procedures and other uh, filtering procedures include tube shunts and recently minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries uh, have become the order of the day usually in management, initial management at least of mild to moderate glaucomas. Now Shabeclectomy is by, by, by far the gold standard uh, primary glaucoma filtering surgery and it lowers intraocular pressure by diverting the aqueous into subconjunctival space from the anterior chamber and alternate drainage to uh, bypass the poorly functional aqueous outflow pathway and it is one glaucoma filtering procedure like the tube shunts which can overcome obstruction at the level of trabecular meshwork, work, Schlem's canal, aqueous veins, scleral channels and episcleral vein pressure uh, elevation. Now, the indications are when there is documented visual field and optic nerve damage in spite of maximum tolerated medical therapy and laser, and there is failure of medical therapy owing to several reasons such as ineffectiveness, intolerance, allergies, uh, poor adherence or uh, complications uh, arising out of uh, medical treatment. And uh, in general, when intraocular pressure is high enough uh, to cause uh, uh, progressive optic nerve or visual field changes, uh, will, uh, uh, trabeclectomy is indicated. Now, uh, when we think of uh, outcomes, uh, we need to be very careful about choosing the eyes and patients uh, who would favorably respond to trabeclectomy. These include essentially the primary glaucomas with the virgin eyes in which conjunctiva has been untouched. There has been no prior ocular or conjunctival surgeries. And even in certain eyes in which uh, have not undergone surgery, if there is significant conjunctival scarring due to surface ocular disease or other causes, and if there has been long-term glaucoma medical therapy, which can cause significant conjunctival inflammation, ocular inflammations, neovascular glaucomas, iridocornea endothelial syndromes, and secondary developmental glaucomas can all compromise a very favorable outcome in case of trabeclectomy. Now, preoperative considerations, as uh, uh, apart from the uh, eyes which need to be selected carefully, we also need to ensure adequate and appropriate anesthesia is uh, administered. All kinds of anesthesia can be uh, uh, preferred depending upon the individual needs. And uh, most uh, preferred and the safest probably is topical. Topical is not like what you would see in cataract surgeries where only topical drops are used, but it is combined with intracameral lignocaine and subconjunctival infiltration of lignocaine. And for several reasons, this is advantageous and uh, more safer than peribulbar, retrobulbar. And what we commonly follow in our institution is uh, subtenons. Now, traction suture. Now, in order, if you are not using topical anesthesia, when uh, can uh, obtain adequate exposure of the uh, superior sclera and the conjunctiva, probably you may have to go in for traction sutures. The most uh, popular ones have been these, uh, the 
bridal suture, superior rectus bridal suture. But the problem is you are violating the conjunctiva, there could be bleeding, subconjunctival hemorrhage, which can actually compromise the uh, success of trabeculectomy. Alternative is, of course, the corneal, uh, superior corneal uh, suture, traction suture, uh, which can actually uh, obviate the uh, complications which one would see in uh, uh, superior rectus bridal suture and uh, probably would get adequate exposure as well. It minimizes the conjunctival trauma and probably the risk of post-operative ptosis. And there are studies to prove that uh, corneal traction sutures may probably result in better surgical outcomes. The conjunctival incision, both phonics-based and limbus-based, uh, are, uh, uh, are possible, but uh, the outcomes, uh, as far as intraocular pressures are concerned, are probably comparable between the two approaches. What we usually prefer is the phonics based conjunctive flap because it is uh, because of it is uh, extensive exposure one could get, and the visualization one could get. A little as uh, very little assist, uh, assistance is required from a second uh, a nurse or a nursing assistant. And uh, what is most important is you can get very diffuse blebs with phonics based flaps and cystic blebs, focal cystic blebs, avascular blebs leading on to blebitis, bleb related infections, which are very common with limbus based flaps, are very, very uncommon in uh, situations where you uh, use phonics based flaps. Antimetabolites, again, to increase the chances for uh, uh, surgical outcomes because of. Uh, improvement in the wound healing response but there could be complications if uh, use of mitomycin and pifluorouracil is little injudicious they could lead on to thin avascular blebs cystic blebs and complications of all overfiltration like the bleb leaks hypotony increased incidence of blebitis and endophthalmitis are all common so we need to assess what is the risk involved in bleb fibrosis and use exposure of uh, mitomycin and the dosage of mitomycin that would be very appropriate for the risk involved. Uh, another alternative uh, administ uh, route of administration of antimetabolites would be a subconjunctival injection. And the studies have also shown that uh, the results between uh, subconjunctival injection of mitomycin or subconjunctival sponge application of uh, antifibroblastic substances have been quite comparable. Uh, the injections we use uh, commonly use these days because it's much more easier. Now, the scleral flap dissection can be done in any uh, shape as one desires and thinks it is convenient. Usually use the rectangular or the triangular flap. Triangulars are much more easier and uh, this uh, one thing we need to imp importantly remember is that the, uh, the scleral corneal pocket which we try to create with a crescent blade uh, needs to be of uniform thickness so that you try to raise a very uh, not so thin or a very thick uh, scleral flap and uh, you need to really make sure that it is of uniform thickness uh, because complications are possible at this stage which can compromise the outcomes one if you the thickness is very uh, if it is very deep, you can prematurely enter into the choroidal space. Or if it is thin, very thin, especially close to the limbus, it's possible to buttonhole the scleral flap, in which case you may have to totally abandon the site of trabeculectomy and shift to another site. And very rarely, we can get this uh, thin or perforated scleral flaps after completing the trabeculectomy, in which case it's very, very difficult to get a get an eye with the adequate intraocular pressure and we may have there may be overfiltration the leak may not be able to be controlled and we need to go for scleral patch grafts uh, this is just to uh, show the triangular flap which is uh, uh, equally easier to uh, do compared to rectangular flaps but uh, you need to take the same amount of care which you do when you take a scleral or scleral uh, sclerocorneal pocket in any other shape anterior chamber paracentesis prior to you enter the anterior chamber is very important so that you try to decompress the globe and uh, the intraocular pressures within the eye are near normal to that and equalizes to that of the atmospheric pressure so that sudden decompression can lead to a lot of complications including suprachoroidal hemorrhage or choroidal uh, effusions the anterior chamber entry is the next step and uh, you do it with the uh, kelly sponge and you need to, again, at this step, we need to be very, very careful that we do not perforate the 
scale flag. And once, yes, once the anterior chamber uh, is entered, you inflate the eye, anterior chamber of the eye with the balanced salt solution and the internal sclerostomy can be done with a jelly sponge. Punch is rotated perpendicular to the scleral bed. And it is, although it is called trabeculectomy, it is not necessary that we have to really excise a portion of the trabecular meshwork. In fact, a portion of the peripheral cornea, if it is excised to create a nice uh, uh, one, one square millimeter opening, it is sufficient to allow egress of aqueous from the anterior chamber. Peripheral iridectomy is definitely important step, especially in fakie guys to prevent uh, closure of the internal sclerostomy and also to prevent any uh, inflammatory post-operative pupillary block. The scleral flap is again uh, another important step. It needs to be watertight. There are several ways of closing. One is uh, uh, just closing it with fixed sutures of 10 0 nylon. Alternatively, we can also go in for several releasable uh, sutures. So the, the idea is to ensure that the the scleral flap closure is very airtight, so there is no overfiltration in the immediate post-operative period because this can cause several complications, including choroidal hemorrhage and persistent hypotony can also cause a lot of complications. Uh, more uh, equally important is the because whatever as is coming out into the subconjunctival space should stay there so that. Uh, uh, excessive fibrosis does not occur. So it's important to close the conjunctiva airtight. You usually do it with the, either white rail or it can be even done with the 10 nylon. But what is important is several uh, uh, eyes can have post-operative leak through a fornic space flap. So it's very important that even the free edge of the conjunctival flap here is closed with 10 nylon until uh, sufficient healing occurs so that there is no early post-operative leak. So post-operative medications would include uh, topical steroids tapered over uh, three months, ideally. Topical antibiotics until the release of sutures, usually for a period of a uh, week to 10 days. And in all fakie guys, we usually prefer mild cycloplegia, especially if you prefer to do a trabeculectomy in eyes with uh, uh, angle closure glaucoma and leave behind the lens. Uh, atropin for a few weeks is a must to prevent the shallowing of anterior chamber and aqueous misdirection, which these eye, eyes are at very high risk of. Assessing post-operative filtration is very, very important. And we need to, the first three days or 72 hours is very, very crucial because most of the wound healing response and blood fibrosis starts to occur within this interval. And it's very important to have a close watch on the level of intraocular pressure, the blood appearance, anterior chamber depth, corneal clarity, and retinal evaluation in the first post-operative week. Now, post-operatively, when there is low intraocular pressure and a low filtering pleb, it's usually due to uh, leaking or uh, plebs or wound leaks uh, through the conjunctiva, which needs to be fixed immediately, if either through tissue glues in the, in, in the outpatient or we may, if the leaks are large uh, due to conjunctival button holes, we may have to take the patient to the theater and uh, re-suture the leaking wound. Uh, sometimes choroidal effusions, if they are uh, not involving the posterior pole, they could be observed with uh, mm. conservative treatment. And of course, there is always some initial inflammation which can cause uh, low intraocular pressure, which usually settles down with steroids. Very rarely, cyclodialysis can cause very low intraocular pressures post-operatively. Again, a high intraocular pressure with a low blood and a deep anterior chamber is usually due to underfiltration. This is the most uh, other another common complication or not complication <clears throat> or an adverse event which we normally see and we need to fix it early so that long-term outcomes are sufficiently uh, good uh, this situation can arise out of tight scleral flap closure or early episcleral fibrosis or internal sclerostomy closure now the tight scleral flap closure can be either due to tight sutures per se or due to early episcleral fibrosis. And this you can deal with slightly increasing the topical steroids. And if they do not respond, probably we should go in for release of the, the sutures if they have been releasable sutures or use argon laser or uh, any other uh, semiconductor diode laser to lyse the sutures and which can actually enhance filtration to a significant extent. 
if they if this procedure fails to lower the intraocular pressure we usually add glaucoma medications uh, generally topical aqueous suppressants one or a combination to ensure the pressures are low and uh, in case uh, this does not uh, happen with late blep fibrosis we may have to go in for a needling of the blebs with adjunctive mitomycin very rarely long term failure of uh, uh, filtering blebs can indicate is an indication for repeat trabeculectomy or tube shunts so in summary selection of eyes not at risk of failure is important when you are performing a <coughs> primary trabeculectomy discontinue medications causing congenital inflammations uh, principally prostaglandins prior to use you may even use uh, preoperative uh, steroids for a few days to increase uh, the chances of uh, wound healing favorably reduce preoperative intraocular pressure maximally so that uh, uh, risk of uh, choroidal hemorrhage and effusions are minimized and meticulous technique to avoid overfiltration and a very close follow up perhaps once a week for the first few post operative weeks is crucial to enhance filtration thank you thank you very much uh, dr uh, krishna das a uh, very wonderful talk i just wanted one question uh, what are your thoughts about giving injection mitomycin instead of using uh, mitomycin uh, sponges this is routinely followed by some of us madam in our institution and i feel this is easier and more time consuming and uh, i can also you can uh, the surgery can also be done under topical because we mix mitomycin with uh, uh, lignocaine and uh, the results there have been several randomized studies both uh, published and our own results say that uh, uh, the outcomes are quite uh, favorable and uh, sometimes uh, in the beginning of our career uh, young surgeons may even leave uh, sponges of mitomycin so that risk is not there with uh, inject mitomycin injections i prefer mitomycin injections because it's easier and uh, less time consuming Dr. Harsh, you have anything to add before we go on to our next speaker? Uh, no, I think we go ahead, please, because we are yeah. really short of time. We can yeah. take the questions in the end. Yeah. So, Dr. George Putran would be our next speaker, who would be dealing on glaucoma drainage devices and its role in glaucoma management. A wonderful human being above all his attributes, and he heads the glaucoma department at Adil Dai Hospitals and is actively involved in training residents, fellows, and practicing ophthalmologists. his areas of interest are usage of glaucoma drainage device and refractive glaucoma glaucomas and he works closely with the oral lab manufacturing wing to create affordable aqueous implants on to you dr george thank you ma'am good afternoon everybody uh, it's difficult to follow my guru as a speaker but i will try so the plan today over the next 10 george, 10 minutes george, george share your screen i want it it says shared oh I, I think you have to. It says we can see your screen with the different. Yeah, uh, you have to choose the presentation. You have no? to choose the presentation. Choose the presentation, George. Choose yeah. the presentation. Yeah, and then put it on slide share. And then, yes, that's it. You. Yeah. You you are able to see. No, no you have to click again. Your PG update PowerPoint. I'll do a stop share. I'll go for a share screen. Yes, share screen. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. 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 Yes, Judge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the plan for the next ten minutes is to look at uh, principal indications, designs, surgical technique, and complications of aqueous drainage implants, which might probably be a technically more correct term than glaucoma drainage devices. I'll try to cover this from purely a po postgraduate perspective. So the principle is all aqueous drainage implants have a silicon tube that drains aqueous humor from the anterior chamber or the posterior chamber to an end plate situated in the equatorial region of the globe and one characteristic common to all aqueous drainage implants is the end plate is made of biocompatible material to which fibroblasts cannot adhere so aqueous pools between the end plate and the non adherent capsule So after several weeks, about five to six weeks of uh, surgical implantation, a fibrous capsule forms around the episcleral plate. And as I mentioned earlier, it is non-adherent to the episcleral plate. So the aqueous draining through the device to the through the tube pools in this potential space 
between the epistleral plate and the non adherent fibrous capsule and this can be demonstrated ultrasonographically so the aqueous passes via passive diffusion through the fibrous capsule and is absorbed by the periocular capillaries so indications medically uncontrolled glaucoma where trabeculectomy has failed or is unlikely to succeed so traditionally the teaching has been that aqueous drainage implants are reserved for patients with ambulatory vision and to prefer a cyclophoto uh, cyclophotogrammetry procedure for patients with nil visual potential so any any surge any secondary glaucoma which have had prior intraocular surgeries like penetrating keratoplasty those who had vitreoretinal surgeries previous encircling band silicon oil uh, pass plana vitrectomies are all good candidates for aqueous drainage implant surgery a whole lot of secondary glaucomas like neovascular ubi tic fibrous epithelial ingrowth iridocorneal endothelial syndrome Uh, are all indications for aqueous drainage implant surgery again patients with congenital glaucoma who have had failed angle surgery or had failed trabeculectomy again here it's indicated for an aqueous drainage implant surgery many of the developmental glaucomas associated with ocular anomalies like uh, axenfeld rega aniridias are also it's much more favorable outcomes for uh, aqueous drainage implant surgery than a trabeculectomy and as i had mentioned there are two groups of patients where the trabeculectomy is unlikely to succeed the post op the intraoperative complications pose a huge risk and glaucoma surgeons prefer to use aqueous drainage implant surgery for ocular phacomatosis sturge fever and also the similar similar results for trabeculectomy with fak glaucoma and fak especially patients with patients having fak following congenital glaucoma surgery coming to the implant designs they differ in size shape and the material which they use the end plate material with which the end plate is is uh, is manufactured and uh, it also depending on whether you have a valve or an, you have a valve which uh, restricts the flow of aqueous when the pressures go too low whether you have a valve or not the implants are again divided into valved and non valved implants so ahmed glaucoma valve is a very commonly used valve implant uh, made of silicon earlier it was polypropylene fp7 and fp8 are very common commonly used uh, uh, used implants the fp7 is a larger surface area of 184 mm square the fp8 is a 96 mm square implant Uh, we also have the recent M4 porous plate poly uh, porous plate implant, which is made of polyethylene. So, as I was mentioning, this has a valve mechanism where there are silicon elastomer membranes that separates with an IOP of eight to twelve millimeters of mercury. Croupin uh, valve with disc is also an example of a valve implant. So, the Pavel glaucoma implant and the Orolab aqueous drainage implants are non-valve implants. They are they are made of barium impregnated silicon. Uh, 350 mm square implants are available with both the BGI and the RD and an additional 250 mm square implant is available with a Pavel glaucoma implant the advantage of having this uh, large surface it, the advantage of the Pavel glaucoma implant with RD is that you have a larger surface area epithelial plate implanted in the single quadrant and a larger surface area could predispose to a larger surface area filtration because the the capsule that forms is of a larger area and also has a thinner is also thinner Molteno, the pediatric, the single plate and double plates are available, made of polypropylene. The double plate has, uh, has a second plate, which can be, which is connected with a 10 m, 10 millimeter silicon tube. It can be placed over the superior rectus or underneath the superior rectus. Surgical technique is very similar in, in respect to the type of implant used. The differences in the size of the conjunctival incision naturally because the smaller surface area implants would require a much smaller. Conjunct table incision. Also, you need to have temporary restriction of flow with non-valved implants. Another thing that is different is you need to have you need to do a priming for an Ahmed glaucoma valve. You inject balanced salt solution into the tube through a 27 gauge gauge cannula, and uh, the silic the valve mechanism, the venturi flow technology, is set in motion. So the end plate positioning is uh, important. Supra temporal quadrant is the most preferred uh, choice of. Uh, placing your episcleral plate and it has to be at least 9 to 10 mm the anterior edge of the episcleral plate should be about 9 to 10 mm from the limbus the the uh, the bowel and the uh, and the rd the wings have to be tucked underneath the adjacent rectus muscles that is the superior and the lateral rectus muscles so this is very important for a non valved implant you don't have a mal valve mechanism so till your fibrous capsule forms around the episcleral plate which should take about 5 to 6 weeks you have to completely 
temporarily occlude the tube and we prefer to do it with a 6-0 vicral ligature suture and this uh, spontaneously uh, spontaneously dissolves and the tube patency is re-established re by the six weeks postoperatively. Again, this is the most critical step. We use a 23-gauge uh, uh, scleral, scleral track to guide the tube into the anterior chamber and ideally you require about two millimeters of tube visualized in the anterior chamber. And good to have some uh, donor patch material covering the anterior part of the tube, which can be donor sclera or donor cornea. So as with any other glaucoma surgery, meticulous conjunctival closure is absolutely vital for implant, uh, implant surgery also. So we try to position the tube as far away from the corneal endothelium and try to get it uh, in between uh, and not, and it should also not be touching the iris. So we should also know that apart from anterior chamber placement, sulcus placement of tubes is also possible. And especially to maximize the distance of the tube from the corneal endothelium, especially if you have a post keratoplasty eye and if a ciliary sulcus placement is feasible, this, uh, this affords us maximum chances for long-term graft survival. Again, pasplana tube insertion is also possible because sometimes uh, your anti there may not be adequate depth uh, in the anterior chamber for a safe tube placement, especially compromised by vitreous. You have a lot of anterior PAs uh, and also in certain situations where your surgery is being planned with concomitant vitreoretal surgery like silicone oil removal, you could as well place your tube into the pasplana and into the vitreous cavity. Also having a lot of uh, scarring near the limbus due to Pre multiple previous surgeries where there's extensive dense scarring at the limbus is also an indication for pass planar tube indication. Coming to the complications, uh, early post-op hypotony. Hypotony related complications like shallow chambers and choroidal effusions are not uncommon with aqueous drainage implant surgery, but most of them resolve well with medical management and the indications for uh, a choroidal drainage is probably only when there is uh, 360 degree kissing choroidals and uh, involving the macula also. So tube blockages in the immediate post-operative period can occur with blood, fibrin, uh, both of which usually resolve spontaneously, but vitreous iris and silicone oil might have to be removed surgically. Uh, tube, uh, surgeons may have occasionally may need to lengthen uh, tubes because of tube retractions. There is a commercially available device, the same company which manufactures the Ahmed glaucoma, they provide a tube extender which can be used by glaucoma surgeons to lengthen retracted tubes. In spite of meticulous tube placement and conjunctival closures, corneal related problems, tube corneal touch can occur. So many of them may have to be repositioned to the anterior chamber in a, at a much more posterior location. Tube exposures uh, do occur in spite of the, uh, of the modern episcleral tunnel track, tube exposures do occur. And uh, again, it might have to be repositioned to a separate site in the anterior chamber and you need to provide adequate uh, extra donor corneal sclera, uh, uh, provide stroma for conjunctival to heal over, the, uh, heal over the exposed tube. So this is, a more, this is more of a common complication with the Ahmed glaucoma valve where you have uh, in the late post-operative period, you can have high intraocular pressures due to thickened capsules. And, uh, you, and very, very rarely, you might also have to go back again and uh, excise a part of the capsule underneath the conjunctiva to restore intraocular pressure control. And finally, tube extrusions uh, can occur very rarely, but occur more commonly in the pediatric age group. And uh, tube exposures and extrusions are the most important risk factors for endophthalmitis. And once plate exposes, I don't think we have any choice but to remove the plate because any, any trial at uh, trying to repair it doesn't succeed because of uh, tissue integrity. So that was my last slide and thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Dr. George. Dr. Hush, do you have any question for him? I know there is very, very nice and simple. Yeah, very, very nice. Very, very elaborate and very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, should I go on to the next speaker? Yeah, please. We will take yeah. the questions in the end. So Dr. Murli Arigal is going to be detailing us on evaluating NTG and its course. He's the director of Swami Eye Clinic and has had uh, 
is the head of the department of the Ofthal uh, department of the SM of Chennai with 25 years of experience. He has held special interest in perimetry and UL lasers, has over 30 peer-reviewed publications and 10 book chapters. He has been the past treasurer and GSI and editor-in-chief of GSI newsletter and associate editor of the TNOA journal. Dr. Murli, we look forward to hearing from you about normal tension glaucoma. I'm sure there's lots you can tell us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chitra. And, uh, I think you have to be louder. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chitra, and uh, thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, I think we really had a wonderful symposium today. And of course, I'm not going to delay it much, and I'm going to start without much delay. Uh, normal tension glaucoma, or it's also called as low tension glaucoma, as uh, we understand it. Uh, what is typical normal tension glaucoma? Is patients with the so-called normal appearing open angles with typical optic nerve head damage and visual fields which are typical of glaucoma, but the IOP is less than 21 on at least more than one occasion. The normal tension glaucoma and the so-called primary open end glaucoma, chronic open end glaucoma represents a continuum of glaucomas and the mechanism of glaucoma shifts from a predominantly elevated IOP in the chronic OAGs as well as compared to the additional IOP independent factors in the normal tension glaucoma. So you have to recognize that there's a continuum or a spectrum and you can have a mixed kind of uh, glaucoma in which you have a variation, uh, variables like other factors other than intraocular pressure, which can cause the glaucoma. We all know the significance of intraocular pressure and causing glaucoma. The intraocular pressure has been considered to be a risk factor, but not the only cause. And there is a skew towards the higher pressures in the general population and uh, the Gaussian curve, where the pressure is definitely on the higher side, towards the right. Uh, the prevalence among the white populations, the prevalence of be about one third of that of the POAG. Suppose you see 100 POAGs, you'll probably see a third, 130 to 40% would be more NTG. And the Japanese have reported the highest prevalence of about 92% of their open angle glaucomas being NTGs. Similarly, very high in South Korea, Singapore, and China. Uh, we don't have exact data for normal tension glaucoma in India. And uh, many of the papers and publications have alluded to the presence of NTG, but they're not given exact figures. I'm just showing you one table from Ronnie's paper on the Chennai glaucoma survey, which has shown that if you take a mean or a single intraocular pressure measurement, which would uh, show that definitely POAGs and NTG is quite common, even as high as one third or two thirds, as the uh, slide is showing you the presence of POAG occurring at pressures between 16 and 20 and even 24. So that uh, we, we, we may be missing a lot of NTGs in our population if you just go by the diagnosis of glaucoma based on intraocular pressure alone. So the key take home here is intraocular pressure is a risk factor. Don't take intraocular pressure as an important uh, diagnostic tool and don't base diagnosis of glaucoma on intraocular pressure alone. So how do you identify NTG? Intraocular pressure being within 21 millimeters on more than one occasion, a dianal facing would be ideal. The central corneal thickness may be thinner than average. The optic nerve head in a few studies has shown a thinner neural rim inferiorly and infrotemporally. The presence of optic disc hemorrhages said to be typical. RNFL defects in NTG is supposed to be more localized and closer to fixation. A peripapillary atrophy or a halo is supposed to be a feature of the NTG. Acquired pits of the optic nerve have been reported in NTG also. Coming to visual fields, deeper scotomas, more localized scotomas and scotomas closer to fixation have been observed. And But you must make sure that NTG is a true NTG. There are no history or signs of any other eye disease or steroid usage, which can cause the glaucoma. So systemic associations have known to be uh, very commonly associated with NTG. Nocturnal dips in the blood pressure, particularly people, they say, who are over-treated for systemic hypertension. So coordinate the physician and make sure the BP is not over-treated and the BP doesn't dip. The greater asymptomatic myocardial ischemias, migraine headaches, vasospastic phenomenon have been reported in the West very commonly as Raynaud's phenomenon. And of course, uh, even sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea has been uh, reported as an association with NTG. So genetics of NTG, uh, one such mutation in the optineurin has been found in families with normal tension glaucoma. 
This is a typical appearance of the disc. You can look at the uh, this halo here, the peripapillary atrophy, the excavated uh, disc, and you can see the uh, disc hemorrhage. There's another picture showing you the disc hemorrhage, the RNFL defect, as well as the classic field defect and the uh, scotoma close to fixation and the corresponding OCT image also. This is typical NTG. Who is at risk? The NTG population is generally female, older, than, about 10 years older than the so-called high pressure glaucomas. And you can expect to have some systemic disease, like even collagen vascular diseases, migraine, Raynaud's, cardiac arrhythmias, and you should look for that and make sure that the uh, pressures have been not possible. You must not miss the spike and diagnose the NTG when the variation in pressure can be there through the day. Differential diagnosis, congenital disc anomalies like pits, colobomas, tilted discs, and so on can be uh, misdiagnosed as uh, NTG. Uh, acquired disorders include the uh, variable IOP measurements. Again, as I already mentioned, a diurnal measurement and multiple measurements through the day can exclude a high pressure glaucoma being dubbed as normal tension glaucoma and you measure it the off peak uh, intraocular pressure. Angle closure disease sometimes is misdiagnosed. A careful gonioscopy is very important. A creeping angle closure can be missed. And uh, when the pressures are low and the agonioscopy is not done carefully, you can miss an angle closure disease. Steroid history with any root of steroid usage can result in uh, glaucoma which can appear like normal tension. Trauma or surgery, ocular surgery in the past which has led to high IOP and that can also cause uh, misdiagnosis of NTGs, hemodynamic crisis, blood loss in the past, and uh, methyl alcohol poisoning in the past, optic neuritis, ischemic optic neuropathies, arteritic and non arteritic, and of course, lastly, compressive lesions in the optic nerve, such as meningiomas and vascular lesions, as Dr. Chitra first pointed out in a, slide, in a presentation, many, many slides showing you that uh, compressive lesions can mimic NTG. Uh, the blood pressure is very important and uh, whenever I diagnose somebody with an NTG, classical, typical NTG, I would refer to a physician and consider doing a 24-hour BP monitoring for some time. You can actually see the fluctuations in the BP which occur throughout the day and over-treating systemic hypertension can actually lead to nocturnal hypertension. BP for all of us would dip at bedtime. And a nocturnal dipper is uh, supposed to be a very high risk for normal tension glaucoma. So we should avoid the dip in uh, blood pressure at night. And uh, sometimes I also consider doing an ocular blood flow, either the colored up imaging or the OCT angio. But these are not given consistent results. And we're not really sure of what to do with the information which you obtain with the ocular blood flow. But ocular blood flow studies have shown decrease in the ocular blood flow in uh, patients with normal tension glaucoma. A lot of work has been done, a lot of publications too. But again, we're not really sure of how to use this data in, uh, consistently in clinical practice. Uh, indications for imaging, I think, are very important. You must know when to image, do an MRI or a CT scan for a patient with suspected normal tension glaucoma. The younger patients, sudden onset, severe headaches, localizing any neurological symptoms or signs, in ocular conditions like color vision abnormalities and you suspect an optic nerve pathology, pallor of the or market pallor of the optic nerve, highly asymmetric cupping, a lack of disc field correlation, and a visual field defect that respects the vertical meridian. And of course, sometimes the sudden rapid glaucoma progression, otherwise somebody who's been a very slow progressor, a sudden progression, progression may actually uh, necessarily need for a neuroimaging in normal tension glaucoma. Uh, glaucoma is said to be a three-pressure disease. You have the uh, intraocular pressure, of course, and you also have the blood pressure, and now we have a third component called the CSF pressure. So patients with normal tension glaucoma have shown a lower CSF pressure than the normal population. So low CSF pressure is supposed to increase the a new concept called the CSF pressure and the translaminar pressure difference. When you have a low CSF pressure, can actually contribute to the presence of a glaucomatous looking optic nerve. The natural cause, what happens if you don't treat uh, uh, normal tension glaucoma? This uh, has come out from the study called the Collaborative Normal Tension Glaucoma Study and the natural cause of untreated glaucoma, untreated NTG. 140 patients were in this study were randomized to treatment or no treatment, the primary outcome being disease progression using fields and stereo photographs. With a 30% reduction in IOP, progression was noted only in 12% of treated eyes. 
there is 35 percent progress in the untreated eyes so half of these untreated eyes progress further in seven years but there's a lot of variability in the progression which are supposed to be more in women those with migraine headaches and optic disc hemorrhage so untreated ntgs are likely to progress they need monitoring but again the downside is that even treated patients can progress and untreated patients may sometimes remain non-progressive for many years so that is the catch so managing ntg uh, has been lowering intraocular pressure primarily cnd uh, the uh, collaborative gl normal tension glaucoma study has shown that we reduce iop by 30 percent it definitely uh, reduces the risk of progression but there's a greater incidence and greater risk of cataracts with the treatment many patients did not progress in the untreated group uh, which uh, which suggests that the benefit of iop lowering may be variable in normal tension glaucoma and this newer study called the low tension glaucoma treatment study in which brimonidine has been used to treat patients brimonidine is supposed to help reduce the progression in, in treated eyes with brimonidine only 9% progression was observed as compared to timolol where 39% of timolol patients progressed so possible neuroprotective effect of brimonidine has been observed but this particular study had a very high dropout rate in patients using brimonidine so that has to be kept in mind with the study interpretation so the current gold standard of medical treatment for ntg is a prostaglandin analog beta blockers are said to have a deleterious effect on the normal tension glaucoma so we do not use beta blockers in the treatment of normal tension glaucoma one study has shown that a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor may actually show better nocturnal iop control so carbonic anhydrase inhibitors have also been considered in the management of ntg lasers in surgery Laser trabeculoplasty has been tried, but generally is not a first choice for most practitioners dealing with NTG. Trabeculectomy can be tried if glaucoma is progressing despite medical management, but you must take precautions to avoid the hypotony and the trab-related complication because as such, the IOP is very low, and so the chance of getting hypotony is quite high. So you must take precautions to avoid hypotony at any cost. But the trabeculectomy has an advantage, surgery has an advantage in that the vaginectomy is said to blunt the diurnal and the nocturnal iop fluctuations that happen with the ntg there have been many non proven therapies in the management of ntgs all of us love to give our antioxidants and supplements and so on memantine is one drug which has been tried in the past it's an nmd antagonist and uh, its role in human glaucoma is still unproven but many of us still try it out you know prostron is a prostaglandin which is supposed to have some neuroprotective effect oral calcium channel blockers have been used extensively in the past particularly oral nifedipin again we don't know whether they are really helping this patient or not one other role has been uh, which has been advocated is the role of statins which are anti apoptotic and neuroprotective in the management of ntg so statins have also been advocated ginkgo biloba is very popular in certain countries in japan and even certain centers in the us use a lot of ginkgo biloba and of course resveratrol from the uh, berries has also been tried as a treatment for neuroprotection in uh, ntgs so, so to summarize uh, take home points from my talk in ntg ntg is basically a sub type of open eye glaucoma non iop factors will have a greater role here so confirm the diagnosis by a diurnal facing gonioscopy and exclude secondary causes make sure you don't miss neurological conditions that can mimic ntg a disc hemorrhage and a beta zone of peripapillary atrophy is seen and may have a poor prognosis and indicate progression certain field defects are sort of supposed to be typical of ntg they are closer to fixation they may be more focal a physician consultation for systemic disease association this nocturnal hypotension and sleep apnea i think you should do that for every patient whom you di diagnose as normal tension glaucoma and definitely i would avoid topical beta blockers and prefer a prostaglandin analog because they they don't work at night thank you for your attention Thank you very much, Dr. Murli. That was a very, very detailed talk. Very interesting. Dr. Harsh, can we rapidly take some questions? Yeah, Chitra, some questions are very important uh, because uh, PGs have been repeatedly asking. Krishna, Dr. Krishna Das, are you there? Dr. Dr. Yes, Krishna. sir. Yes, sir. Harsh. Yeah, yeah Harsh, sir. I am there. Sir, yeah. please uh, explain clearly what percentage of mitomycin uh, is to be injected where is it to be injected when is it to be injected how much time before the surgery uh, and how much xylocaine so can you just clearly elaborate that procedure okay in short uh, the time of exposure of mitomycin oh. 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 and uh, dosage will depend upon the risk factors involved in failure for example if you are operating on a primary open angle glaucoma 
patient, uh, an elder patient, say about 50, 60 years, in which uh, the risk of fibrosis is minimal, you probably should use a 0.2 percent, 0.2 milligram per ml, which is 0.02 percent. Now, how do we prepare this? Mitomycin is available as a two milligram uh, uh, powdered, uh, uh, powdered uh, uh, form, and uh, you just uh, uh, mix it with the 10 ml of balanced salt solution, sterile balanced salt solution. So you get 0.2 milligram per ml, and you just take about 0.1 cc of this and inject this. Um, for mitomycin injections, we normally use a lesser one, lesser concentration, usually about a half of what I have said. So to prepare that, you just need to take one ml of the 10 ml solution, mix it again with the 10 ml of balanced salt solution and take a 0.1 cc of this and inject it. You may find it difficult to remember this, but all standard textbooks and uh, any publications on mitomycin will give you uh, how to prepare this uh, mitomycin concentration. Now, how if much you are dealing with the more... How much Hirsch, before the surgery? How much just, before the surgery? Uh, okay. Uh, if you are uh, using mitomycin sponges, you just have to uh, use uh, uh, soak the sponges with the uh, mitomycin I have just mentioned and keep it under the subconjunctival space posteriorly. And for about uh, two minutes in eyes in which there is little risk of... Uh, uh, failure. Suppose if you are uh, doing a combined surgery in which the risk of fibrosis is higher, you use the same concentration for four minutes. Do not increase the concentration in primary surgeries because it can increase the risk of uh, hypotony and other re complications related to anti-metabolites. Now, if you are operating on a patient with, say, uh, uveitic glaucoma or neovascular glaucoma or ICE syndrome, in these situations, we usually prefer a tube shunt, but should you prefer to do a trabeclectomy, you should use 0.04% or 0.4 milligram of mitomycin for four to five minutes. Now, if you mix five ml of balanced salt solution instead of 10 ml to two milligram of mitomycin, you get 0.04%. That's in short. But most standard uh, textbooks would describe this. Uh, Krishna, how much before? They are asking how much before the surgery? 10 minutes? Oh, no, no, minutes. no, 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 no. Subconjunctival sponges have to be kept after raising the no, conjunctival not, not sponges, the injection. 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 Just, yeah, before, uh, just, injection. Yeah, just before you raise this uh, conjunctival flap. Just before you raise. So yeah, that will yeah. be almost on just the table. Minute. On the oh. table, before you begin your surgery, begin... Doing peritomy, you inject mitomycin mixed with uh, lignocaine. And then do you wash it or you don't wash it? You we don't wash it, it because uh, the con it's still under subconjunctival. You cannot wash it. What It forms a balloon. So what you do is use a swab stick to milk it out so that it spreads evenly. Okay. Okay. A quick question to uh, uh, Vinay, uh, Vinay Nangya, Dr. Uh, uh, is brinzo and brimonidine combination, how good is it in your hands? How much pressure lowering does it give you? And how often do you use it? Um, I mean, I think that um, it's, it's a good combination drug. And the only difficulty is that, um, and the pressure reducing efficacy is also all right. Uh, my first preference is, of course, uh, uh, using a beta blocker and an alpha agonist as a as a combination drug and my that what you've asked is my second preference as a combination drug but the biggest challenge to us has been the development of bulbar allergy with follicles in the bulbar conjunctiva actually that's been the biggest challenge with using this combination of drops and uh, so that is something that you know each individual practitioner has to see for himself uh, in terms of those patients that can tolerate this medicines and then move ahead with it Dr. Tanuj, are you there? Yes, yes, I am there. Okay, Tanuj, there must be some, some of your uh, uh, people only. They are asking, sir, should we do UBM and uh, ASOCT uh, in PAC cases to decide whether uh, uh, PI is to be done or not? No, never. <laughs> not indicated. Okay, how? Gonios uh, which, gonios, which gonioscope we should buy, sir? You can buy Goldman 2-minor gonioscope. 
How like, often have you got stumped with plateau IRS in your practice? Like, no, oh, we man. have we have got few cases of plateau IRS, but you know, if you are good at gonioscopy, you can diagnose plateau IRS on gonioscopy. So I don't think UBM is actually required for routine management of angle closure glaucoma. So for anybody, you will not uh, say a four mirror uh, indentation gonioscope, but you would prefer a two mirror gonioscope. Yeah, two mirror will give you a good balance between you know your money and what you get. So I think that is good enough. <laughs> okay, okay, George and Tanuj both. Uh, why don't we make a uh, common? Uh, we make an auto scleral pocket. Uh, instead of uh, having the scleral patch over there, people who do not have access to scleral patch, can they just make an auto scleral pocket? Because I have had a couple of patients who are very, very disturbed at the cosmetic look of that scleral patch, which is just, uh, which is seen if it is just put at the, that fornix place. So I think the first issue is that if you make that, don't use a scleral flap, you will see over 10, 15 years, that will erode and your tube will get exposed. That is number one. Uh -huh. Second issue is you can also use, you know, take off the endothelium and use a cornea instead of the spheral flap. You can use a cornea if available. That does the same job. But I think in such cases, the site threatening part is very important. Cosmesis plays less role. Okay, George, you are there. George, yeah, yeah I, I'm here, sir. So, so for yeah. the glaucoma surgeons, I, I, I did, I kept this out of the talk because it was for postgraduates. For the glaucoma surgeons, we have hundred percent now shifted to a totally patch-free, flap-free, flap-free tube implantation. We take a twenty-three gauge bent needle and make a four millimeter long a scleral track, and uh, a scleral track. And we have our recently we have our results published very recently in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. So uh, what the advantages of having a scleral track is your tube is very snugly fit in the in the sclera. It's patient's own sclera. The caveat is to have a nice adequate length and depth of the scleral track. And uh, how, how what is your follow-up of that? See, because Tanuj is saying after 15 years, it'll have 10 years, it'll erode. So, what is your follow-up of this? So precisely the reason why this technique has not been studied in detail in history because surgeons want to, don't want to take a risk with implanting a tube without a patch. But if you look at if you look at literature, all literature says the the patch-free technique, the rate of exposures. I'm purely talking talking to the glaucoma surgeons here, not for the postgraduates. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for. Uh, for glaucoma surgeons, and you look at literature, all literature supports patch-free, tube-free implantation. And our results are, for a minimum of uh, two years, we also have uh, adult and pediatric in this. There is a very good Mexican publication, which looked at 128 eyes for a mean follow-up of more than two years. Not a single child had a tube exposure. We have other problems like tube retractions, tube corneal touch, but I, I strongly advocate a patch-free, flap-free, scleral track. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Shushmita, are you there? Yes, 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 sir, I'm there. Uh, in hypertension, can we use mannitol in hypertension is asked by Kritika. Can we use mannitol use safely mannitol. in high hypertension? No, not at all because you lead to a cardiac overload because it's going straight into the intravascular space. So blood pressure uh, before giving mannitol is very, very important. Yeah, we wouldn't do that. Okay, Dr. Krishna Das, uh, what is your uh, uh, this thing with Ologen? Uh, well, I, I have not found it very useful. So what I do is when I cannot use mitomycin, like in very young myopes, usually yeah. below the age of 30-35, uh, juvenile glaucomas, especially if they are myopes, the chances of getting very thin blebs or hypotony myclopathy is very high if I use uh, even 5-FU, the weaker of the antimetoplites. So I use uh, Ologen for these individuals, but not as a routine. Okay, uh, medical management, uh, how, uh, Dr. Nayak, have you tried Repatech? Dr. Nayak, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm there. <clears throat> Thank yeah. you for remembering me. <laughs> no, no. Thank you for remembering me, and at least I'm not in a blind spot. Okay, so <laughs> Repatech, basically, uh, and I will answer the previous question also, which was, uh, Address to Vinay Nangya. 
that the the combination you said no the brinzolam yeah brinzobrimo ha ha yes so that is none of the medicine out this combination is a mm. is the first line of medical management so right. this is only comes once you are you have exhausted with the other and only advantage with this is that you can have this combination along with the because earlier all combinations were beta blockers or some other medicine so beta blocker was common so then you can two combination you can prescribe and bypass that number one and number two ripatec ripatec definitely it is not the again first line of management but where it has really found a role in my practice especially because i don't know how far it is the cystoid macular edema or the corneal edema or the post operative patient so post operative where i have to give now any anti glaucoma medication i prefer this because it has some anti inflammatory role as well as reducing the edema okay. but the pressure lowering effect is not as great as the the timolol beta blockers or prostaglandin analogs right right and what is your experience with ceflutan sir ceflutan to be frank enough have not used you know okay so sushmita can you tell us about that So, saflutan we found was a little lesser efficacious compared to the latinoprost and travoprost. When we gave in a couple of patients who said they couldn't uh, tolerate that, is it But, more uh, tolerable? No, it causes more redness, and they were uh, they were concerned about that. And Ripatec, we'd actually started, but then the lockdown happened, and I wish those patients would come. <laughs> But they seem to be all right because there are no complaints. But frankly, I I don't know. Can okay, I submit Murli. one comment about the main? Yeah, one, please, one, please. Uh, just one that uh, somebody asked about the FDT. That in this day, time and age of COVID, because it, if you have the matrix, it's a good alternative if you really want to do a visual field and avoid the bowl because there's no bowl there. Okay, Chandrama, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, somebody is asking, how would you measure the size of an iridotomy? How would you measure the size? Yeah, because we keep telling them do two hundred microns. So how exactly uh, would you measure? <laughs> we keep talking the to them. The point is basically the percolation of aqueous into the AC. Right. When you're giving the shot, the moment you see the aqueous coming in, uh, the materials dispersing into the AC. Right. That is the end point actually. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So that that is right. You have to see because the trans illumination is not. Yeah. and if ever you feel that it is not complete you can still go in but uh, the smallest size of the light point in the uh, in our uh, slit lamps is 0.2 so if you focus that over there exactly then probably you'll get 200 microns and probably even your la yes. la laser spots are also 200 microns without the lens you can focus that also yeah. so murli quickly if you have 14 mm iop no previous uh and uh, advanced field uh, moderately advanced field damage other uh, so would you uh, with uh, no previous fields would you wait for progression to make sure that you have want to treat an ntg or uh, you will straight away go and treat this ntg now with one single measurement of intraocular pressure and one single field i would definitely not treat because even if it is ntg it's not going to progress overnight so you do have some time it's better to do a proper dynal facing get pressure measurement several times again as i repeated the gonioscopy has to be done and one field is not going to be enough do at least a couple of fields to make sure the field effect is reproducible and then uh, suppose you have established the diagnosis a classic ntg then i would not hesitate to treat okay oh. i think chitra we are pretty much there i yeah. think so shall i conclude yeah please i think it was yeah. wonderfully so, done and all I'm the speakers sure are so clear so <laughs> so sure that each of us have enjoyed this update and my very special thanks to my expert distinguished panel who have been there right through the whole thing and it was such an encouragement for all the pgs and the other attendees my most respected moderators my top notch speakers who all made today so special my heartfelt thanks to my dear arc team my thanks to our sponsors entod pharma who have supported arc in every single program my special thanks to kripal from ars headquarters and mr sunil for being a constant support and guidance with all our speakers my special thanks to my ever supportive numerotech and sai for their amazing contribution 
And my most, most special thanks to my dear audience for being patient and with us all through. We will back, be back to you again with many more useful PG updates. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Be safe. 